Good morning, everybody. You are tuned to Computers 2K now on the Nissan Communications Network. I'm Amnon, your host for the next few hours, along with Mike. Good morning. And Nick. Oh, hi. And Steve. Good morning. I don't know if Steve was here. Hello. Hi, Nick. I did say hi, but, uh, well, yes, Skype. Thanks, oh, yes. Microsoft. Our number is 919-518-9773. Or Computers 2K Voice on Skype. And this morning's show is being brought to you by that VidBlasterGuy.com, Tom Sinclair, and by Atomus.com, makers of quality video recorders and converters for professionals. And today, Steve is... It is, in fact. I can't see much. It's uh, the 6th. No, it's the 8th. We do it the other way around. It's today the is the 8th. Yes. June 8th. Why, why do you do it the other way around? You're the only country that does. We're the only ones who get it right. We're unique in the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. There's that one way of looking at it, I suppose. Anyway, carry on. Sorry. <laughs> um, I see I still have Bruce down there, which is... He needs to turn the light on. He's looking very in the sort of in the background. Um, and Nick, yeah. you're looking remarkably awake for this time of the morning. What happened? Uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. You're looking. What, what did you're you say? looking remarkably awake for this time of the morning. I still can't hear Steve. That's just not making up for saying all that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got up. I got up. I got up 15 minutes ago. I got some. Got some coffee, and now we're all, we're all ready to go. Excellent. That's that's what we like to hear. Why do I hear an echo in here? Check. Uh-oh. Turn your speakers down. Check. No, it's coming from over there, but the speakers over there are off. No, it's it's coming from the rack, sort of. So you probably, do you have, like, the stream up on our, on the rack? Uh, I've got Wirecast on the rack, but the speakers are powered down. Mm -hmm. Magic speakers. Magic Check. Jack. Check. Check. No, it's fine. Oh, this is the clearest I've heard Amnon in uh, six months of doing the show. The loudest, for sure. <laughs> it is? Oh, yeah. Wow. No, no, it was a joke. It was a joke. Oh, oh, oh no, 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 no. You were talking into the microphone. You were talking I know, I know it. why. I was playing with this yesterday to try something, and I forgot to leave the... I, I forgot to put the faders back. Is this better now? There we go. There we go. Don't hey, touch, look, touch there, there are faders anything. that move up and down. When there's no show, I do stuff. Yeah, I know. So, yeah, hush, hush, hush. Hush. <laughs> do you have an internal speaker on the computer or something that's playing it by accident? The what? I said, did you figure out your echo problem? It stopped. That's weird. I wonder if, you, I wonder if there's like an internal speaker playing. Okay, know. well, good. That was fun. Now, yep, uh, on to something important. If oh. you are still using Nick's favorite operating system, which is Windows XP, let me give you a big word of warning. If you okay. used uh, Microsoft Security Essentials for your antivirus software based on our recommendation or any recommendation, you need to understand that it no longer works. 
and that little red icon that says that it is not working, you have a problem, is there to tell you that it is not working and you have a problem. And what that means you should do is install, we're using Avast, I don't know, some people love it, some people hate it, that's your, matter, that's your uh, opinion, but you need to install a different antivirus program. I'm installing Avast on all the computers, the XP machines that I'm maintaining. So far, I don't have any problem with it. I am right. installing the very minimal version of it. There, When you install it, there are all sorts of click boxes and check boxes for do you want to add this protection and that protection? I don't check any of that. The only thing I don't like about Avast is you have to give them your email address. So if you have a throwaway email address, you might want to use that one instead. If you don't enter an email address, then it times out in 30 days. Right. And, and it's free. The, the truth is you can put anything you want in there. It doesn't matter if it's not a legitimate email address. I don't know why they're doing it. They're not verifying. So you can put XYZ at XTZ.XXX, right. and it, it works. Mailinator.org Ma takes... is the solution. Well, okay, but hang on a second. You don't know whether six months or down the road right. they're going to say you need to re-register, and if you don't get the message, I don't I, know what's going to happen. I agree. That's, but if you, that, th the but if thing you put is, on a throwaway account, will you see it anyway? Well, I, I have about well, four different email accounts that I check on a regular basis. And one of them one is of, your throwaway? One of them is a total throwaway. I couldn't care less what's sent to that account. Okay. In fact, it's an Earthlink account. I oh, expect nice. it to go away unannounced at I don't any know, point in time. I don't know that you don't want to get correspondence from them. It's important to get correspondence from Avast if something goes wrong, if something goes astray, if, you know. So don't use your regular email, but use an email that you do get uh, mail from them. And to tell you the truth, I don't know. I don't think I've got any. It's been what now? Over a month. I don't know that I got any emails from them. Oh, I don't think I have either. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's okay. And and uh, I don't know how many of you guys tried it. Uh, remember I was telling you that you can probably, this is a feature that a lot of ISPs support and they don't even know that they're supporting it. If, uh, if, uh, if your email is, I, mean, I don't know, I don't know about Gmail, you can try it. But if you go and you put, if let's say your email address is mike at gmail.com, I have a lot of emails that would say Amnon dash twc at deltaforce.net my email address is amnon at deltaforce.net but if you put the dash something that will identify who this email was given to so if i see an email coming to me from uh, let me let me back up and i'm i'm getting ahead of myself if you do that and you put dash and whatever you want to put after that. It's not limited to uh, just two or three letters, but it makes more sense. See if you get, send an email to that address and see if you get it. If you get it, that means your ISP supports it. And then you can have emails. I wouldn't call them throwaways, but you can trace. If you start getting uh, spam and you see that it's coming to Amnon dash um, Home Depot at DeltaForce.net, then I know that Home Depot gave my address somewhere. So just use the first part of your email address, your name and number or whatever is there, hyphen an identifier for yourself, something you can identify at wherever it is. Send an email to that address, see if you get it. And then you can have all types of email address for each and every uh, vendor out there. So I, I've got amnon-avast at deltaforce.net. There was only... Some, as I recall, some mail servers will work with a dot. Um, 
Okay, I don't know. I know that it'll work either with the hyphen or the plus. For the plus, Maybe they I'm sorry, you're right. It's the plus, not the dot. Yeah, but for the plus, they actually have to go and change it to a plus. By default, it's hyphen. And, and like I, I said, one. yeah, a lot of them don't know it. So, so try. If it doesn't work with the minus, with a hyphen, put a plus and see if that works. And it's uh, it's really nice to to have it like this. And if you ever wanted to stop email from coming to that, you go into your spam filter and you say, "I do not want." I mean, that email address disregard. What I, I like, um, I really like Gmail. I mean, for fifteen gigabytes of space yeah. Yeah. for free. I mean, there's a lot to like about it. There's a lot to Can't dislike it. about it. But there's one thing that I really dislike about Gmail, and that is I have not found a way to have it reject an, an email from a sender. You can have it go to spam, but you cannot have it outright reject it that I have seen. If anyone knows how to do that, let me know. Yeah, the, I, I don't I know. I can go into my, my, email, my email accounts. I have my own email account. I have my own domains, and for any email address on that domain, I can go into cPanel, go into the mail, mail, and tell it that if an email is sent to a particular email address, bounce it, and it'll send it back with no mail on this server, no no user on this server. And so but what that- happens is, let's suppose I sign up for a, an email address, Microsoft Security Essentials at MikePhillips.com. That comes into the default email account, which is also a Gmail account, which means all the spam is filtered out. When I go in there, it's it's about 95% legitimate email. And But uh, then if I, like when Microsoft Security Essentials goes away and I don't want to use that email address anymore, or if it gets, I want to change it to MSE1, then I just go into control panel and tell it to bounce a message sent to that email address, and now it's no longer forwarded to the Gmail account. Right. That that's when you when you have control over your mail. Yes. Then but you Gmail can Gmail needs to add that. Yeah, I don't I don't think that that's that's a blacklist. It, versus it's a, a white it's a server bounce is saying yeah. there is no such email address Correct. here. Yep. And I would like to have that capability. Yes, sir. Um so I'm spending this morning yeah. reinstalling. Uh, I'm installing Kubuntu on my Chromebook, and um, and now I'm just backing up the Chromebook in case I screw everything up. Are you reinstalling it or installing it for the first time? I I haven't inst- I have it installed now, but it's a version. Um, it's a lighter weight version of Linux. But the the, the problem is is. I, I just don't use Linux enough where like, I need, like, the app store that Ubuntu has. Like, I, I spent, like, 45 minutes trying to install Google Chrome yesterday, and I, I just couldn't get it. I kept getting all these dependency errors, and I just... It's it, it's just a real pain. Because the Chromebook, it's, it's... You're using this knockoff... Not a knockoff version, but a modified version of an already existing uh, distribution, and it's just... Things are missing, and there's just no good tutorials. So mm-hmm. we're trying, uh, trying Kubuntu, and I'll keep you updated. We're good. Keep us posted. What? How's how it's going? Um, let's see. Chinese ICT developer Huawei has confirmed that it was able to achieve a record transmission data rate of 10.53 gigabits on 5 gigahertz frequency bands in laboratory trials on their new 802-11AX. That's Wi-Fi. The testing, which was conducted at Huawei's uh, campus in Shenzhen, used a mix of MIMO, OFDA, Intelligence Spectrum Allocation, Interference, Coordination, and Hybrid, blah, 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 blah. Um, that's great, but I would never use one of their routers. 
Who, who is this? Huawei. I've never heard of them. They're that um, Chinese company that put a back door in their routers. Uh, now, now I know who you're talking about. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of other U.S. manufacturers that actually just have it branded as their brand, and it's made by that company. So I don't know. It's it just uh, it, better safe than sorry, as they say. I, 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 how, how do you know? That I mean, you, you say you won't. You say you wouldn't buy their router because you know that they're doing. They have a back door, but then you also just said that like regular manufacturers are just reselling their routers. Right. Are they make? Are they modifying those changes or is no, there still I'd, a back door in those I, ones? There's still. A, from what I heard, it's still there's still a back door. Uh, that's a problem. Um, but the pro the problem is to find out whether a manufacturer is actually have their own or they get it from them, or if, like you said, if they modified the settings or there. So when the time comes, you do some research and find out. But it's uh, okay. It's a problem. Yeah, oh, sure. Andrew saying it's pronounced Huawei. 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 Thanks, so Andrew. I, so I purchased a new product this week. Uh huh. Purchased a uh, my my first UPS. It's a uh, let's see. Let me sign in here. Take a look at it. It's an APC. Um. 800 VA, 540 watt, 120 volt battery backup. It's the uh, APC Backup UPS RS800 model. It actually, oh, it's still on sale. Uh, retails for retails for about 160, and you can get it on eBay for 50 dollars still. Um, so if you're looking, if you need another UPS and you're not looking to spend 100 plus dollars, here here's one for 50. Shipping is free. Uh, it does take about two weeks, or a little, about a week and a half to get there, but um, there it is. A great UPS. Yeah. The R and, the it's, R and it's still $50 if it's still yeah. on sale. So The why. RS series is a great series from APC. Yeah, let's talk about it. Why, Mike? I, why? I, don't, I wonder why they're so cheap. Mike, what can go wrong with the the UPS why a lot. why is it getting old why why what's old about it the battery uh, no not just the battery what else you have to well think about this i mean if you're they're new I, by I the way they're not used you know i understand but but in terms of, of of what can go wrong with a UPS these this chinese stuff is made such that the margins of the components are just non-existent. I mean, they there are some some parts, some some units that you can buy. I don't know how much they do it anymore, but back in the old days, the um, uh, you you could buy a motherboard that uh, has five volt rails in it, and it might have six volt capacitors in it. You say, well, it's okay. Well, it is okay, except that capacitors are not precision devices. Uh, these that are rated for six volts, most of them will probably go seven, eight, nine, ten volts, but a certain number of them go to four and a half volts. So you end up. This is where you, you remember hearing stories, Amnon, of these loud popping noises coming out of motherboards. Oh yeah, that's because the manufacturers decided they could get away by putting cheaper parts in there, and right. putting parts that had no margins in them, and and so this is what happens: is the You'll see this an awful lot in light dimming switches. You know how these things turn brown? You'll see it in CFL bulbs, how they turn brown and they're supposed to be low power. It's because the components in there, in the inverters and the converters, are exceptionally uh, tightly rated so that they can buy the cheaper parts. So what can go wrong with a UPS? Let me ask you this. How much... Uh, how many computer power supplies have you replaced in the last 10 years? 
I don't know, 20, 30, 50, not many. Right. Well, I think, I think it's a lot uh, because if I go back and think through the, when I was in the radio business, that I replaced maybe one power supply in anything the whole time that I was in the business. They, they were industrial-grade versions. They were quality pieces of equipment that you just didn't have failures. And now you've already said you've replaced, say, 50 of them. That's yeah. because they're so cheap. If, and and if, you take, if you were to look at a schematic diagram and understand what you're looking at as to the component choices and how, how crappy these things are made, it's amazing that they work as well as they do, but we want stuff cheap. And so all that gets to is that these UPSs are made very cheaply. The components can, can uh, some can degrade on, over time like anything, but at, the, but at the same time, some can degrade quicker because they do not have the built-in uh, uh, headroom in their designs. And Gary will tell you, he says they are switching power supplies. Capacitors have the wrong ripple current rating cause most failures. And the ones that do not have the proper ripple current uh, rating are cheaper than the ones that do. It's a, it's a higher quality capacitor, so they use the cre cheap crap in them. But, and, of course, but, but then, Mike. then, 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 then. You, you get a capacitor go bad, and it creates a a, uh, a domino effect, and that is you put uh, excessive stress on the semiconductors, then they pop, and then they pop, and then other semiconductors pop, and you end up with a chain reaction, and you throw it in a trash can. Okay. That's why nobody ever fixes these switching power supplies. But, Mike, you you are missing – I mean, I'm looking at the, at a big picture here. Yes. It's $50. No, not I just understand. that. Not just that. Everything else in the market is the same way. Exactly right. So, so why, is this why would you buy one for one hundred and fifty dollars? What is better about it? Tell me. There are, and Gary may have looked at this more than I have because he's still in the industrial market. But the higher price, you can find an eight hundred VA UPS. Oh for yeah, fifty for dollars or for two hundred and fifty dollars. Right. This is norm, but uh, this one doesn't retail for fifty. I understand. But so, what I'm saying is, and by, I'm not putting that one down. I, I, I look, quickly before you before you keep going, like um, the it says that this the unit is a special build, and the phone and network ports don't do anything. So maybe that's why it's oh. cheaper. But uh, I mean, that's not important to me. Yeah, that's I'm, that's not important. What, what I'm wondering here is if APC or or this company that's selling it on eBay got a request from a company to get them special built without the data ports working. And the company uh, backed out on their thing, and now they're left with like, you know, very two thousand UPSs. Very possible. Very possible. It's either that, or there was a manufacturing error, and they mail made thousands of these things and forgot yeah. to hook up the internal protection. Because all they do on those uh, all those devices, they have wires on them that, in essence, they're loop throughs, but they have. Uh, surge protectors internally so maybe they left out the surge protectors maybe they put the wrong connectors in them and it's easy they, well they just, they're designed without it to work that maybe maybe not I, I don't know I mean you to save money by leaving those disconnected a company would have to buy an awful lot of them yeah they've already sold over a thousand so oh I mean they'd have to be in the the hundred thousand range for that difference in manufacturability to make a price much price difference. I think what happened is they got them out there, found out they didn't work, and then they decided to surplus them. And yeah. but I'm like you, if if you're not using those anyway, which I don't, who right. cares? Yeah, well, well, I don't even see the point of using them. Right. Well, I mean, look, eight hundred and fifty for forty nine dollars is a great deal any way you look at it. Sure. And even if the battery is bad, buy a new one. That's cheap to replace the battery. Mm. That's about twenty some dollars because they use just yeah. one. Yeah, it's over half the price. I mean, it depends on where you get it. Now you're ordering them off eBay, typically, Amnon, or you're not going over to Batteries Plus. Uh, are Batteries you? Plus is only about five bucks more than what I can get it on eBay. Okay. If I need them right away, I go to Batteries Plus. If I have time to spare, I get them from eBay. Right. But. Uh, it's it's a good deal. I mean, normally we see the the four fifty and the three fifty in that range. Yeah. Oh no, I think it's a good buy. I, but but I mean, it's it's not a commercial grade piece of no, equipment. It's no, consumer it's not. Equipment. No, it's not. 
But Absolutely I wouldn't hesitate not. to buy one for each computer. You're not going to get much hold-up time, but that's not really what you're after anyway. You're after yeah. enough time to competently shut down the computer before you lose anything. I'm really lucky. The other the other night, there was a, or what was it, two weeks ago or whatever, a house in my neighborhood was struck by lightning. I'm really lucky that, uh, that, that we didn't have any surges here. Well, they also, these these units, even if they claim not to have surge protection built in, oh, the, they do, this one does, yeah. They, they do provide some degree of isolation from the mains power line, mm-hmm. and you can get a lightning strike near your house, and it can take out an awful lot of equipment, and you, your chances of surviving that strike are better if there's a UPS between you and the power than there is if it's not there. Yep. Gary, I have a question for you. And 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 anyone who doesn't understand the question, just bear with me because um, it may sound a little silly. But let's assume we have two situations. We have two computers in a lab sitting side by side. They Both computers have identical video cards, identical hard drives, identical motherboards, Everything is identical between the two. One computer has a 400 VA power supply. The other computer has a 1,000 VA power supply. You're talking about UPS or power supply? Power supply. Okay. 400 is what some manufacturer may ship. 1,000 is what a gamer might put in it. Well, I always saw them measured by watts. Not by VA. VA and watts are the same thing for most for the, for okay. the discussion. All right. VA is volt amperes. So here's the question. Identical computers, one has a 400 VA power supply, the other has a 1,000 VA power supply. How much more power is the 1,000 VA power supply going to, not the power supply, but how much more power is the computer with the 1,000 VA power supply going to consume than the one with the 400 VA is going to consume. Now, I I think I know, but I am curious what you think. And I'll, hmm. I'll go ahead and tell you what I think the answer is. The answer is that the power that a computer consumes is equal to the power delivered to the computer plus the quiescent or operating current of the power supply. So the difference in power between the two would be the difference in the quiescent current between the 1,000 and the 400, which is probably not that significant. He hadn't said anything yet, so maybe he went and... <laughs> so anyway, we'll move on. <laughs> He'll say so he's probably typing. Yeah, we'll see. If he's watching on his tablet, he's probably taking forever to get it to type anything. At a recent conference, Comcast... He says they're the same. What's the same? The two two computers are going to pull the same amount of power. Which is what I said, which is they're going to be almost the same. The, there, there may be some difference in operating power of the bigger power supply... It may have some higher quiescent currents, but I don't think it's going to be significant. So anyway, go ahead. Um, At a recent conference, Comcast CEO Brian Roberts rationalized charging Netflix to deliver content by comparing Comcast to the post office, saying that Netflix pays to mail DVDs to its customers but not expects to be able to deliver the same content over the Internet for free. He forgot to mention that the post office does not charge recipients for those DVDs. The underlying issue is this debate is who will invest in the Internet infrastructure that we badly need. Comcast has a distinctive, a disincentive to invest because... If things bog down, people will blame content providers like Netflix and the ISP will be able to charge the content provider for adequate adequate service. If ISPs have insufficient incentive to invest in infrastructure, who will? Google? Telephone companies? 
Government? What happened to Mike? The video kicked us off. So, Mike, are you not even in audio here? As far as I know, I am. Oh, you are, yeah. Oh, there you are. So, um, it's it's really interesting that because uh, Comcast is not allowing Netflix traffic to go at full blast like everybody else, people are blaming Netflix or even your local ISP. Let's say I'm on Time Warner and I have only half a megabit up and down, assuming... As somebody who's just trying to save money and is not technical, and by the way, um, this week when I was talking to <laughs> Time Warner, you know how they advertise 1495 fast internet? Yeah. Do you know what the <clears throat> speed is? High speed, I guess. You know what's the high speed? No. It's below one megabit, and the up speed is below 384. Yeah, it's still high speed enough. It, they call it high speed. So, uh -huh. when somebody hears, oh, 1495, high speed internet. Yeah, I'm going to get it. I can watch movies. They're not technical. They start watching and it's buffering and it's not going. Enough. Who are they going to blame? Netflix. Netflix. Hey, Netflix, why can't I get you? I've got high speed internet. So, this is kind of... Uh, a tricky situation for providers like Netflix. And I think Comcast is uh, taking advantage of that situation by saying, okay, Netflix, you see, you're going to have to pay more. Maybe. Speaking of Netflix... Gary saying some some gen low frequency noise. Um, let me turn off my microphone. Uh, Mike, do you hear it? Uh, Nick, you with the I headphones? Have, do I don't you have hear headphones it? On. I, I have headphones on. It could be if his tablet is plugged into the wall, he could be hearing it. But do you hear any noise? No, but okay, I would no. probably wouldn't. Hear. Well, no, I'd hear it through Skype. Okay. Yeah, Mike, go ahead. Speaking of Netflix, do you have it, Amnon? Yeah. Okay. Uh, what do you watch on it? I, I don't, myself, I don't do anything with Kathy does. I mean, she said, hey, let's watch a movie, and she'll do it with a tablet and with uh, movies. No, uh, she was watching Breaking <laughs> Bad on it back when. Oh, very nice. So, sure. But right now, it's mainly movies. Well, I, for some reason, I got on a kick of binge watching. And one of the shows that I watched based on recommendation <clears throat> was Orange is the New Black. And a new series was released Friday. I've watched three or four episodes of it and have yet to find one redeeming scene in the entire second series. So far it has been pure trash, pure garbage. And if anybody else has watched it and is enjoying it, I'd love to. I'd love to know about it because I cannot believe how bad it is. And this was after watching Scandal. I watched the entire series, and it is the second worst TV series I've ever watched. Absolutely nonsense bullcrap. Um, Mike, remember, this is this is... You can't argue about taste. Somebody may think that it's or, a great show. Of, you know. Yeah, or lack of taste. Well, I don't know about the lack of taste. I think well, some I, people Amnon. like these things. Amnon, forget yeah. the political side of this, all right? Forget, no, not political. I'm not talking politics. I'm yeah. going to talk about reality. Yeah. The show Scandal is based on a corrupt president. Yeah. The show started in 2012 or 2011 or 2012. 
All right. Who was president then? Our esteem. Our current esteemed president. Yeah. All right. The, the, the premise of the show is a corrupt administration. Yeah. The, Repu- the president is a Republican. Now, how can that be? They're, they're even talking about historical figures, and yes, this is the White House where John John was under the desk and Monica Lewinsky was under the desk and, and all that stuff. And, and yet, it's a current, the current president is a Republican. And, and to add insult to injury, many of the scandals are exactly a lot of the same scandals that are going on in the Obama administration. Okay. What kind of editorial comment is that? Well, now now you're getting to politics. No, 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 no. I, if, if it were the other way around, I would be laughing about it, but I think that that... I just think there's no character at all in any of these people who put these shows together. Uh, if, did, if the table had been reversed, this show would have gotten more screaming and, and whining and moaning and gnashing of teeth than anything since <laughs> the beginning of time. Well. Brent, I'm glad you said that Two and a Half Men is the worst show. That's one of the ones on the list. I'll mark it off. I just, that's just time of my life I'll never get back. And again, if you're talking about two and a half men, when, when, I mean, I'm, I'm a Star Trek fan. And when Star Trek, uh, Next Generation came up, I thought it was the worst. I think we're getting used to a certain mood, certain direction, certain whatever you want to call it in a show, and we watch it and watch it and watch it and watch it, and then when it's changing, we we lose interest and say it's the worst. Now I love watching Star Trek The Next Generation because um, you, you realize, oh, yeah, it is a good show. But back then, I said, what? No, Kirk? What, what kind of? No, there's no way. So, mm. I mean, do I enjoy uh, the new uh, Two and a Half Men? Not as much as I used to enjoy the old one, but it's still kind of funny. I will say, that, just to show that I'm trying to be objective here, that what I posted to Gene in chat is that forget the skewed plot on Scandal. The acting is horrendous. Absolutely horrible. I mean, oh. it's it's just... I, in fact, what I found, I did a little research on this lady who is apparently the writer and the creator and uh, tried to find out why she would be so motivated to have such a skewed and tilted approach. And if you do some research on her background, you'll find out why. And um, But apparently she's also the creator of Grey's Anatomy, which also has this very rapid fire staccato delivery of dialogue that people are talking so fast you can't understand what they're saying. Uh, a problem that has been compounded by uh, Surround Sound 5.1 because now these studios are mixing the dialogue for TV shows for people who have home theater systems with all these great speakers. And many times they're overlooking intelligibility issues on those of us who are still using just the two speakers on the TV. Mm-hmm. That's, just, that's just poor engineering on their part. Okay. I will also add that the TV show, uh, what is Cyrus's uh, real name? Uh, There's a a show here, I mean a a website here that goes into all the information about the characters. And so far, he's not even telling who the real... Who the, who the guy is playing the character. Anyway, the guy who plays Cyrus Vance, I think, is an extraordinary actor. I, I think he just outclasses everybody else on the show. And I compare him favorably with James Spader from Boston Legal and who is now on 
uh, Blacklist, who I think is probably one of the greatest actors of all time. What is this guy's name? I think he's typecast himself, but he's he just does a good job. All right, Nick, what were you going to tell us about Netflix? I wasn't. Okay. What are you watching on Netflix? Uh, nothing currently. I'm uh, going to start the HBO show Silicon Valley. That's apparently really good. It's about a, uh, a startup. If you've got Amazon Prime Instant Video, I don't. Uh, which if, well, if anybody does, um, check out Betas. It's a show about a tech startup. It's a, a it, it's a comedy. It's if you're interested in something like that, that's that's pretty good. That's on Amazon. That's on Amazon. Yeah, it's an Amazon exclusive. And the other things that have been recommended are Lily Hammer, which I've been told not to waste my time. Uh, Walking Dead, which I'm not excited about. Yeah, I, I tried Walking Dead. It, I wasn't. I wasn't happy. How I Met Your Mother. I don't know why anybody would suggest that. That's that's actually not, that's actually a pretty funny show. All right, Trailer Park Boys. That is a great show. Okay. Bates Motel. Never watched it. Fargo. Never watched it. All uh, right, Mark Scandaloff. Uh, you are tuned Valley. to Phillips and Craig. Um, hey, Emma, you you left. <laughs> I know. I the phone <laughs> rang. I thought it was maybe Mike, but it wasn't. <laughs> Silicon Valley, you said to watch in Betas. Beta, yeah, Betas, Betas is pretty good. Betas, doesn't he own Amazon? <laughs> so, you know I, quick update here on the uh, stalling Kribuntu. I have yeah. wiped my device. I have entered into developer mode. I have uh, ran, the, run, ran the script. It is now rebooting. I have to run one more command, and then we'll see what happens. Tum, 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 tum. Uh, if I can hear the noise, Gary's talking about. Mike, this is this is especially for you. Uh oh. Hey, quickly, Emma, before you start. Yeah. Uh, Gary, make sure if your tablet's plugged into the wall, unplug it. Because that could, that could be causing the. the yeah, but he Gary know Gary knows this stuff. He, yeah, he, he does. I mean. I don't know, and maybe because it's too loud. I don't Let hear me. anything. Um, I I I lowered the 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 level of my mic. Well, that doesn't count. Mute, hit the mute button on your mic just a second, Amnon. Now turn it back on. A little background noise, but nothing. Uh... All right, Amnon, look on your mic uh, channel, and you see where it says uh, high pass filter or 80 hertz or something like that, the button. I don't think there is a high pass. Uh, high... There's, there's, there's a, a, there's a, there's a, a there's fader. There's a low, not a high. There's a fader. The, the... No, a fader. It's a button. The button is the low one. Here, let me press it. Okay. You see, huh? G Gary said it's gone. Yeah, but have, it was Gary may be posting when he had his mic turned off too. Oh. Let me turn on the stream. Wasn't you can hear it on Skype? It, I don't. It just sounds like background noise. Yeah. The only thing is, I have the AC. That's all it sounds. It sounds like he's got no, an AC out of the back. But where is where is the the gate the threshold on your gate set, Amnon? Um, right at nine o'clock. All right, everybody, be quiet just a second, and Amnon, crank it up one or two notches until you hear the noise go away. Until who hears the noise? I don't hear the noise. You all right, everybody be really quiet and you start cranking up the threshold. Don't go over three clicks. Do you have another microphone open in the studio? No. That's really strange. I clicked it two. Is the light going red between sentences? 
Oh, wait a second. Wait, 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 wait. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not doing the right mic here. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, they all <laughs> flicker. They all flicker, even though they're not potted up. Yeah. The DBX is are still working. So I was on the wrong one. Okay. Okay. That's better. And the ratio should be at about five to one. He hopefully hasn't messed with any of that. No, I didn't. Now you and have to stay on top of the microphone. If you right, start well, doing this stuff on the microphone, it's going to well, it's going to I, gate I, you. Yeah. So you stay in front of the microphone. If you're going to run the noise in the background, you have to stay in front of the microphone. Well, G Gary, how? I mean, did, did, do you see any any difference, Mike? How many of the uh, the level on the uh, mic, the, the preamp, how many lights should light up the, when the, I'm talking? Forget that. Once you're adjusting the threshold, that's it's too late to go back and adjust that. Okay. All right. That, uh, we, we can deal with that separately, but, is, but that part is not a problem right now. If you go back and change the input gain control, you have to readjust the threshold. All right. Well, if this is okay like that, do you still hear what you were hearing? It's better. Okay. Now, if I... If I take that filter out, did it make any difference? Wow, what is that? Woo! Good, yeah, it's doing it. It's Ubuntu installing. Yeah. Uh, did it make any difference, Mike? No, and I didn't expect it to. There's not okay. a lot of low frequency coming through. It's it's more of a mid-band noise that's getting through that we're... Dan, what, what he has is the 286S... Uh, uh, DBX 286S mic processor that has the gate on it and what we're doing is increasing the threshold on the gate so that it mutes the um, um, it mutes the noise in between sentences so you're not sitting there listening to the air conditioner run in the background when other people are talking right Mike why do you have him on five to one well the, the reality is the guy who invented the box told me that you should run it at ten to one Bob Orban Gary and um, and it's a matter of personal preference the voice is very quick if you mine's on because you told me to put mine on two to one yeah. i don't think so my ratio is just five to one yeah i wouldn't and, have been on anything else well you look look mine are just recommendations if you want to try something else try it just make sure you know what you're listening to so if, if i turn this to five to one i don't hear anything different at all what you would hear is how quickly it snaps the noise off oh. after you stop talking yeah, I don't have a lot of room noise, so it's not really a big deal. Right. So anyway, Gary, where do you run yours and your radio stations? The, um, I mean, the ratio, it's irrelevant where you set the ratio if you have the threshold set wrong. Yeah, my threat. I mean, I, you don't normally hear me cutting out. Right. Because you also stay right on top of the microphone, too. Am not. Th on thanks, on. Mike. Am not will even go over to the bathroom and still talk. <laughs> Oh, nice. Amnon, you need to restart. Well, uh, is Steve still online? Are Steve? you there, Steve? Yeah, I'm still here. Yeah, it's it's working. Why don't you try Call Andrew. calling Andrew? Because I don't know. I don't. Me, it's like Amnon's running like beta Andrew. versions of Skype or something. No, me, me. Oh, okay. Me, 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 Mike, I, Mike, I'm, this is. Uh, well, you're probably not going to be too happy with this, but for my speaker in my in my in my in my studio here, I have been using this this little Bluetooth. It's an HMDX uh, HXP205 mm -hmm. speaker with an aux input. This thing is great. Andrew, why not would I not care? Why would I care? Well, because it's. It, I mean, they're not that high quality, but the my, the big thing with this is. Um, I don't have to plug it in. Okay. Yeah. Well, I don't so care. You, thought you'd be interested. I mean, yeah, it is interesting to know how well they work. But my audio system here is a pair of $25 computer speakers with a subwoofer that I added. It's a concoction of stuff. I actually bought a system that had two speakers and a subwoofer. The regular speakers with it sounded terrible. I put two older speakers I had with it together, and it. I think it sounds pretty there darn is. good. Andrew, you here? Hello. There you are. How are you? Good. How Fine. are you? Fine. How are you?
Good. How much do you love Skype? I um to talk about the DBX, I always suggest five to one. Always. Well, see, here's the thing. Gary is a very good, I don't want to go to his head, very good broadcast engineer. Guy knows his stuff, been doing it a long time. He's old as dirt. And um, I, when, and when he says something, if, even though I disagree with him, I respect what he says, and I try to understand why he feels the way he does because there are things that Gary knows infinitely more about than I do, and contrarily, there are some things I know better than he does. That's okay. Um, if you go to a convention of broadcast engineers, you're not going to have everybody sitting around agreeing with each other 100%. Um, and that's just not the way it works. Having said that, um, Gary is, is typically, as I understand what he's doing, is using the 286S in commercial radio studios, most of which have at least some acoustical treatment in them and, and probably have had attention paid to keeping the noise down as much as possible. Now, I've been in some that were horrible. But most of them, at least they try to pay attention to controlling the acoustics within the room. And in that circumstance, two to one would give you a good result because the transition from talking to quiet is not as abrupt. But when you only go to two to one, two to one is a slope. It's how quickly it uh, mutes the audio after you stop talking. And if you want to try two to one, and if you like it better, go for it. I don't care. It's nothing off my back, but I've run it at 10 to one and had very good results with it. Now, but having one is a little um, aggressive. Say again, 10 to one is a little aggressive. Well, but, but, but don't confuse the threshold on the gate with the, with the slope of the compressor. 10 to one on a compressor is aggressive. I mean, it's, it's very aggressive and it can, it can really suck the life out of the audio. But whenever you have the, the gate set just for muting purposes, I just haven't found a reason not to use five to one. However, anyone who wants to use two to one, go ahead and try it. In fact, I encourage you to try it. I'll, t I'll tell you something. Uh, Spencer uses two to one and he refuses to put it to five to one because he says that he's soft spoken and he can't break through. That has nothing to do with the ratio. And, and he also claims that it distorts his audio, which I'm not even going to get into right now. But if his if his unit is defective, it can cause that. But should, yeah, I mean it's possible. Uh, but he puts it to two to one, and I hear everything happening in that room. Every time he 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 taps on that desk, I hear it. Every time he scratches his head, I hear it. But I still think that's a threshold issue and not a ratio issue. Right. I yeah, agree. that doesn't make any sense because the if as long as the from from what I think I know about the device, if the threshold is set, it shouldn't turn on either way. What I do, I set the ratio to five to one, and then I set the threshold. Well, the the ratio is independent of the threshold. You can have any ratio at any threshold. The threshold is not independent of the input gain control. If you if you reach over and crank up the input to get more LEDs showing, you now have to readjust the ratio. They they are dependent upon each other. Dan well, was I asking mean, whether he should get one. You know what the 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 um, the uh, the two eighty six is it required? Absolutely not. Is it good to have? Absolutely yes. I mean, you know, it, not, it, it does a really good job of helping keep the noise down, particularly when you're doing everything voice only. In Andrew's situation, he has as many as four microphones open in the room with uh, computers and things in the room. To me, it would, be a, it would be suicide for him not to have 286s on his microphones. Well, I'll tell you something. If you are podcasting uh, and it's a little bit more than just a hobby, Right? It's getting a little complicated. You're not just using a, uh, a, a 2100 USB. You know, now, now you're getting a little bit more detailed. You have a mixer. I actually think if you have a mixer and you're, you're not in an acoustically treated room, uh, you should definitely have a DBX. I, I, I would agree with that. For it. You know, I, I, I'm one of these people that says if you are podcasting regularly and you're taking it serious, 
you should have a DVX. Uh, T- Tim's is asking, do I have one? Yeah, I have the. I have an. I have an older one. This one. This one is. This I mean, one it's is, essentially the same thing. Yeah, it was built in 1996, so it's older than I am. I um, mean, radio it's 286. Station. It's the DBX Project One 286. Radio stations with perfectly treated rooms and all this hardware that use them. You know that we, the way that we're doing things in podcasting, should have them. There, it's it's a no brainer. Yeah. Well, Mike I mean, and I it's had a great piece of hardware, and it's it's under two hundred dollars. I mean, right. and you're not going to get for that price range. You're not going to get the level. Of, it, it's the gate alone. You're not going to get that kind of gating on a Behringer or or a Samson or whatever the other ones are on the market right now. Uh, I tell people all the time. You know, these are people with, you know, mic preamps, compressors and gates uh, and they, they go to set it up and they just don't understand why it doesn't sound that great. And the, the problem is that DBX has done a phenomenal job at, at this thing. So, Gary, do you still hear uh, do you still hear the noise from my end? Let us know. You make me feel guilty now for not having one. But Steve, you have a podcast. Well, well, you, you. So, sorry, Nick, I didn't hear you. Oh, I mean, you don't do a, a you don't do uh, you don't host a weekly podcast, do you? Not anymore, no. Yeah, Mike and I had an interest. And when when Mike gets back, I'd like to talk about this a little bit more. We had a really interesting audio conversation last night, and and he he, he disagreed with me on some things, but. Uh, I don't know. It was an interesting thing, and I and I think I summed it up pretty well for, for for what's going on with audio. Gary says no, so I'm guessing he means no. It's not a nice unit. No, he's. I think he's referring to Amnon's question. I think he's he's saying that he can't hear the noise anymore. <clears throat> but I don't remember whether I ask is it better, and he's saying no. I mean, on the Skype line right now, I'm hearing some sort of crackling or like someone's typing. Yeah, not me. Do you guys hear I that? Don't, see, that's that's interesting because I don't hear that. And I'm 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 listening on um, through speakers, and I hear it. Well, good. So I, you know what, Nick, you brought up something interesting. Okay, so I have been. And I'm actually amazed at this. I've been getting a tremendous amount of complaints from people uh, saying that my MP3 file size is too big. How, bi- how big is your MP3 file? I'm interested. So, I, I mean, we rec- I mean, about two years ago, we mm-hmm. upped it from 64 to 128. That's what I do. Okay. Because people were saying, well, you know, I listened to your audio and it doesn't sound as good as this one. And I did it strategically because I didn't think that I needed more. Uh, so we put it up to 128. Everybody said how great it is and how great it sounds and everything sounds so much better. And now I'm starting to get complaints from people telling me that it's, the files are too big. Why is a one hour show or an hour 10, like 40 megs? My 45 minute show is four, was 43 megs. I mean, that, that's not a lot. Go down to 96. What? But he's not going to see that big of a... I mean, if people are complaining about 40, they're going to complain about 30, 35. Well, well, yeah. Here's my point with this. Our, I would imagine that with the way that Internet speeds are and that the fact that everybody at least has at least one megabit per second, you will be able to download this thing quickly. Even you, on four, I mean, even on mobile, everybody has 4G now. You are, right. again, again, you are <clears throat> assuming, Andrew. No, it's... here we go. I've got three bars of 4G at my house. I'm going to open up Beyond Pod and download an episode of, uh, what should I download, Andrew? What the tech? Uh, download what the tech. Well, you um, know what? This may play a big part in it because I'm going to download my show right now and it's taking me 15 minutes for a 90 meg file because of archive, because of the way that archive is functioning. Well, let's find what, let's find what the tech. Here's audio. And I'm going to how do you download it? Um, no, I don't want to stream it. I'd like to download it. 
So I'm trying to download now, and it's telling me two minutes to download that show. What the tech? Yeah, I don't know how to download on Beyond Pod. Let's see here. And I'm getting it at, you know, I'm actually getting it at crappy speeds right now, but. Here we go. All right. So I am downloading What the Tech right now on 4G. Let's see if it gives me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Tim actually asked a good question. What if you have a you have a USB mic? Is there any software for GBX? No, there isn't. No, but it, now, there are a bunch of post processing stuff. Yeah, that's that you what I was do. gonna say. Now, if you're not doing your show live, you don't really need a DBX because you can throw a, a filter on in Audacity or whatever. Well, actually, there is a little trick you can do. You can use certain software like <laughs> Audacity. And Reaper, which is a killer software program for audio. Yeah. It's not easy to learn, but well, it's here, cheap and thing. it's great. It's Mike, have you, looked into, what? have you looked into the Omnia AX and the Omnia FX? I have that. You do? I do. Which one do you have? Um, I don't recall. So the AXE is Omnia processing uh exactly what you would get in the multicast or you know uh the omnia ones you get it on for audio for streaming audio so you could you know if you're you're streaming your audio you could just do omnia processing and just send it out there if you want to put in post processing you could do omnia processing with the fxc all right but there's a problem okay it has about a four second latency well okay but does that would that matter for Something like Mixler? No, I mean, if you're just going to do a stream like that, that's fine for audio only. But if audio you're going to do audio with video, it's toast. You couldn't use it. No, I mean, if you're doing audio only, then this is a this is a decent solution if you want to do something software. It's expensive. How much is it? I just, I thought it was like two three hundred dollars. It could be. There's other software out there that internet broadcasters are using. And in fact, there are two forums on the internet on Facebook that you should join if you're interested in the topic. The first one is one that Nick Andrew and I run called Internet Broadcasting on Facebook. It's the group, and you can be added to that if you request it. Another is called Internet Radio Broadcasting. They take a little different focus than we do. They focus, they're a bunch of, primarily a bunch of radio guys who have gone to the internet and they talk about various things like automation software, how to create a 24 seven radio stream, <clears throat> making sure the music licensing from streamlicensing.com is in place and, and audio processing. And, um, the, uh, trying to remember the name of it, Gary will remember, but there are several software only solutions. Um, one is uh, shoot. Now I'm not going to remember the names of them. Gary, help me out what they are. But one of them, there are actually two of them, and one of them is written by the same guy who wrote the software for Omnia. Or and the other one, <clears throat> StereoTools.com, something like that. I forget what it is, but. There are some software solutions. I've tried them. I have yet to find one I can live with because all of the processing is so boom and sizzle. It is so hard. I have, I've spent a couple of hours with one of these, uh, programs trying to, to get a softer sound because you don't need an AM radio process type signal for internet broadcasting. It's very distracting and it's very fatiguing. You're absolutely uh, right. I, I agree with you 100%. And I think especially with the fact that many of us do video now. And, I mean, you, do you remember when I got my, my Omnia, when I got the uh, multicast, it was very aggressive. I mean, at least to my ears, it was very aggressive. Yes. But to someone in broadcasting, everybody that I asked that, was, that had a background in broadcasting or was an engineer, they said, no, no, this actually, it's not aggressive at all. There's nothing aggressive well, about the audio. This actually is, uh, this is very little processing. I actually but had to have Chris Tobin come in and tune it even further down. And when he did, he goes, you know what, Andrew? It's th that's the difference. It's exactly what you said, Mike. For people in radio, it's a different idea what processing is when it comes to the Internet. Well, 
you, what you need on the internet is consistent level, not boom and sizzle processing. See, on, on AM radio, you're fighting a, a bunch of things, but primarily very limited bandwidth. You have to, you have to have a signal that's very rich in high frequencies and low frequencies to get it to come through an AM radio. AM, AM is a real challenge to do audio processing. FM, much less so, but still there are issues that have to be dealt with, including overmodulation, modulation density, intermodulation distortion. There are all sorts of things you have to deal with that, that really are not much of a problem if you keep your equipment properly maintained and buy good stuff to start with. Having said that, the processing is, I guess, was originally designed to keep radio stations from overmodulating their transmitters because when you overmodulate, you create all sorts of spurious emissions, which make it illegal, and the FCC can fine you or take you off the air. So that's what limiters were originally designed for: was to keep you from overmodulating your transmitter. Over time, stations wanted to get louder and louder and louder, and they wanted it whenever you hit a button on your radio and went to WGY, then it would listen to it for a minute. Then you hit WABC, and now all of a sudden your radio jumps out of your dash because WABC is so much louder. And these were called the loudness wars. Well, that was a WGY. Say again. You're hitting on WGY. Nah, it might be. Um, okay, I hate them too. Okay, but then. Then the transition to FM, starting in the late 60s, early 70s, these what we called uh, AM engineers with dead hearing moved to FM, and now they tried to make these FM signals sound like uh, the AM signal. So they've got these multiband processors cranked all the way up to give them boom and sizzle and this really no dynamics, and which was just unnecessary because... It just uh, an AM signal can sound decent if you don't push it too far, but you can destroy it just like anything. Well, now people are accustomed to hearing badly processed FM, none of Gary's stations, of course, but badly processed FM signals. They go to the internet and they want to make it sound like their FM station. And I don't know why you would want to do that. Uh, I, I mean, it just makes no sense at all to me, but y you have to, you have to back off of it if you want people but to be able to listen to it. The The real change in audio processing happened with discriminant audio processing that Mike DeRoe introduced into the marketplace. with a, He called it the DAP 310, which I have one sitting right here. And uh, it, it really revolutionized audio processing because it allowed you to process the signal more aggressively without it sounding so fatiguing but for reasons we won't get into now. But once he he pioneered that technology, very simplistically, I might add, then others like Bob Orban said, oh, yeah, right, this is a great, a great idea. So then they took the ball and ran with it and came up with all sorts of uh, processes and techniques and tricks after that. And every processor now after that that's any good is using multiband for music. But... Uh, is, is I, all, I'm, all the point of all this diatribe is that do not over overprocess your internet stream. There are some of the guys in this internet radio broadcasting group on Facebook where they post the links to their online radio stations. And as soon as you click on it, all of a sudden your ears get pinned back. And after about three minutes, you just, un unless you're deaf, you have to turn it off. Andrew. Yes. Somewhere on the IAIB, I remember like maybe about a month or a little longer ago, somebody posted a software, and I think it had gating in it. There's a lot of software that does that. Um, okay, I think it was Mo Mo Movie Buff. Movie Buff probably posted it. That yeah, posted, and it was it was a program that you can <clears throat> download, and it was a mixer, and it had gating. On it also. So, Andrew. Yes. I just downloaded my audio file, which is 44 megs. Yeah. In about 30 seconds. Yours took like five minutes. Yeah, because it's the way that Archive is handling it. It's ridiculous. Why are you guys using, why are you guys using Archive for audio? Because uh, it's know. free. Why not? Um, what do you think I'm using? 
Archive. No, I'm not using Archive for audio. What are you using for audio? The, the web server. Oh, oh. I mean, I, I'm You're putting not sure on your own server. Would, I see. Yeah, I'm not sure how that would work with what the tech, yeah. but if you've got unlimited bandwidth on your server, I don't see why you'd be using Archive for audio. It's so low. I mean, they're quick downloads. Yeah, I, I think when we move over to uh, the new server, we're moving over to uh, Brian's server for the website, mm -hmm. I think I'm going to yeah. have him host the audio. Yeah, because, I mean, the audio is just, the audio is not too, uh, too bandwidth intensive. I mean, and I guess it is if you've got thousands of people downloading it, but in, in my case, I don't. So I can, uh, I can do that without a problem. I just don't understand why at times with Archive it's super fast and at times it's super slow. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. I don't care if it's slow on the weekend, you know, like that, I don't, that doesn't matter to me. But if you're a first time listener, you're trying to download this, you're not going to have the patience to sit there and wait. Yeah, I agree. That's a problem. Yeah, I mean, do you know how long it took to download on the radar, Nick? Yeah, oh, the video, yeah, the video is slow. I'm, I'm not saying that the video is fast. It took almost two hours. Well, no, I'm, in my case, it hasn't taken that long, but yeah, and in certain cases, it does. Yeah. I mean, what's the other option, Andrew? Uh, I'm probably gonna end up hosting it, or get another advertiser that's gonna host it. What about what about the what about the hobbyist podcasters? I mean, wh wh what's our solution? It's, it's, see, it's, I think it's easier for you guys um, because if you're doing. If, for example, if you have one podcast, you could use a service like Lipsyn or Blueberry. That's mm -hmm. fine. Yeah. And it'll work well for you. Yeah, because Blip is now closed, so you won't be able to use or they're, well, they're not. Video, you're talking about video. Yeah, yeah, video now. I, the yeah. audio, I got the audio down. The problem is what? RSS. What about yeah. Chirbit? Um, what is Chirbit? See, there's stuff out there you don't know about. Chirbit. Well, that, that's why I asked. Well, that's what I'm telling you. Chirbit is a way of sharing your audio. The problem with Chirbit is there's no RSS feed. You'd have oh, to create your own. But now does it give you a raw? Well, is that for, is that for audio or video? Audio. Yeah, see, I got the audio. I need the video. That's oh. my big problem. Uh, I, I don't understand. What's the difference? The audio is hosted on my web server. It downloads No, no. The video. I'm saying, why couldn't you use video with them? I mean, it's just a file. Mike? I'll say Mike. You're saying that it's for audio only. That's all they select. That's all they allow to upload. Oh. I mean, you can you can go and put the audio. I mean, the video on a Google Drive in that case, and create an RSS on your yeah, no, server. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's actually that's actually not a bad idea. I didn't think about that. Well, how do you do your own RSS? People used to use. I do my own RSS. Well, with so the help of on work. I mean, everything Power generates press. an RSS now. I mean, it's yeah. there's so many plugins and services, but for podcasters, the only the only one is, is that I would recommend is uh Power uh PowerPress. Yeah, I would agree. It's it's the best one. The RSS file that I started with, Gary, was, I think it was written by John Hardy back in the late 90s. Yeah, and I'm sure it does started. fine. And Nick took it and I mean, expanded it and then modified it and expanded it. And it, it's working great now for audio and for video and all that. So Yeah, we did some, we did some of the iTunes stuff in it. But yep. yeah, I mean, you, there's, you just go on Google and search uh, podcast RSS and you can just copy it and update it manually every week like Amnon does. Well, what's the one that Google has that people say is going out of business? Feed burner, but that doesn't generate the feed. You have to put a feed into feed burner. Oh, well, there are websites where you can generate an RSS feed. The, yeah, the, the problem is where you're hosting the files. I mean, that, that, that's the big problem. It is amazing how easy it is to update an RSS file once you have it. Yeah, for, for a few shows, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I just, I guess I don't understand. I don't understand all of the heartburn over the RSS feed and these guys like 
like uh, Daniel J. Lewis and Todd Cochran. Oh, you know, you got to maintain your own RSS feed. You have to maintain control over it. I agree I with guess, them. Well, I, I don't disagree because I don't know that much about it. But what I'm saying is why would you ever give up control of it? Who? Give me an example of where you are giving up your RSS feed. Feed burner. Well, actually, no. What they're talking about is a service like um, Lipson. Crap, what it, Lipson and Podbean, where they host your RSS feed. So, Mike, when you're paying for Podbean to host your podcast, Podbean goes out of business. You are now submitted to iTunes directory and hundreds of other podcast directories under that URL. When they go out of business, you are, your shows are not going to be able to be downloaded anymore because you, they, they own the RSS feed. Now, if MikePhillips.com slash podcast slash RSS is the RSS feed, it, it, it's your choice to submit it wherever you want. It's just like when you have your own email address. Yeah. It's like because Google owns your email address. If they want to shut it down, yeah. they can. If it's on your right. own web server, they don't. They can't. Mike, you'll but be you, surprised how simple it is. If you want to get into I'm, I, I'll, I'll, I'll show you. I can show I, you. Now. I already know. that. I mean, I've already created my own RSS feeds in the past. What I'm trying to understand is what the heartburn is over. What do you mean by heartburn? People lot, get all bent out of shape over. You got to do this. You got to no, do no, that. Do this service. And, there, there is merit to that because a lot of people don't want. I mean, I go like Nick said. I go and I update manually. my RSS feed manually after okay. every show. I'll just go and change the dates in them. A lot of people don't have the ability to do this, or they don't want to do this, and they want it generated. And when you go and you pay somebody to like sin or whoever, and then they, they, uh, they screw up. Who was it that went out? Uh, uh, Blubber? No. Who who no. went out? Uh, it was like one of those Podbean sites or whatever. Um, a lot of people were using it, and suddenly it went out, and everybody had to change. That's where the heartburn coming from. Yeah, because you're already <laughs> submitted to all the directories, and now if you have to change, it's a real pain. Yeah, right. Okay, let me ask you this. Yes. Andrew, check your Skype, please. Um I'm I'm getting annoyed at him. I really am. Oh, come on, Andrew. It's every week, it's, and I'm tired of his mental illness. Yeah, but this is not the place. He has the answers, and everybody's wrong, and everybody he knows better than everybody else. Everything sucks except for what he uses. He doesn't use anything. He he's a, he's an independent. He's an independent who goes and services and maintains radio stations. In all of our area, and I think all over the states now. He knows, so he, knows, he, he comes he across Apple any, sucks, all of them. Microsoft sucks. Omnia sucks. Mike sucks. Nick sucks. Amnon's everybody. I, I, swear, I, don't, I, I, I learn I don't argue with Gary because Gary is, he, I, I like to think that he knows his stuff. And he obviously does because radio stations hire him. On, yeah. As a contractor to come in and do all that kind of stuff, and uh, so it, it doesn't matter. It may be just Gary's uh, opinion, well, but his opinion. His we're opinion all we all. Uh, I mean, I don't know anything about the Omnia, so I could not say anything other than, "Well, I have a friend of mine, Andrew, who uses it, and if he's using it, it must be good." But then somebody can come and argue, well, yeah, but Andrew traded for it, so he had no choice. Well, it doesn't matter. He's using it. No, I'm He's not, not going to screw up his, his service. It's every topic. It's what? annoying. It's every topic. Anytime someone brings something up, he, he knows better. <laughs> you are wants, just, you're wants, giving him. He wants to yeah. use OS2 on a, on a 1975 computer and type away on a mechanical keyboard. That's oh, fine. it's all right. Yeah, I have a mechanical uh, keyboard. <clears throat> Andrew. Andrew, my friend, please take a deep breath. So, Mike, I, 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 I want we didn't to answer my question. What Your question's stupid. You're stupid. I'm sorry. All right, here's my question. What I'm trying to understand is let's assume that I have an audio file on my own server. I write my own RSS feed on my server for that file on my server. I publish that feed, give out the link to, um, I give out that link to, uh, to you to subscribe to my podcast. Why would I ever need FeedBurner? You don't. 
What does feed burner do? It was doing it automatically, right? Nick? Well, I'm sorry. Feed okay, burner so was the, doing the Feed burner was I'm doing sorry. things automatically for podcasters. No. No. The reason you would use something like feed burner Mike is let's say um Okay, so you're hosting it on your web server. Right? I'm, yeah. You, so you're hosting the RSS feed on mikephillips.com. Mm -hmm. You, uh, PodTrack comes along, and for PodTrack to work, you have to um, set you have to set uh, your podcast. So mikephillips.com slash RSS runs through PodTrack, and then you get podtrack.com slash mikephillips slash RSS. Okay. Inside of FeedBurner, you can change what the source or what the yeah what the source URL is. So if you submit mikephillips.com slash RSS to iTunes, that's the only feed that iTunes can see. If you decide that you want to use PodTrack to um to, to, to manage stats or whatever, there's no way for iTunes to see that because it's still got your source URL. So you use something like FeedBurner which, for example, for my show, it's feeds.feedburner.com slash OTR audio. That's what I submit to iTunes. If I move to a different domain, I can change it. If I move to PodTrack, I can save it. If I use Blueberry, I can, I can uh, still use that feeds.feedburner.com feed and change the source URL. If I submitted radargaming.net slash OTR audio, I, I, I'm stuck using that domain and if I want to either move to another domain or use another service for stats, I can't do it. It's almost huh. like a it's almost like a redirect. Well that's what I'm saying. It does seem like a redirect. And that's what it's doing. It's doing a redirect. Now you could also do that on your own web server. You could just you could just have a redirect there, but uh, for everybody uses PodTrack or everybody uses um uh feed burner, so that's just what what I used. That's just what I used. And if, and if they go out of business, there goes half of the iTunes library. So, so the only thing it sounds to me like that's that's really an issue is stats. It's a big thing for a lot of people. A lot of podcasters uh, go by the numbers. Yeah, I, I'm. It's just it, it's all an uh, it's all an opinion thing. It's all an opinion thing. All so, right, so I, I successfully have Linux installed, or Ubuntu installed. Why, why are you installing it? I want to use Skype on my Chromebook, but Skype it won't install. So, it, what, what operating system was on it? Uh, it was a different version of Ubuntu, okay. one, one that was missing dependencies. <clears throat> Is that the one that came on it? No, there's, it doesn't come with Linux. Yeah, what comes with it? Chrome OS. Oh, I see. But now I I've thought got that was Linux. It it is Linux, but you can't act, you can access the kernel, but you can't like boot down to Linux. But like, let's see here. Let me see if I can show you this. So, Mike, what? You can't see it. Go ahead. No. Anyone had at least one Netflix binge, where you end up watching hours of TV despite intending to watch only one episode. Thanks to Netflix automatically playing the next episode. That particular binge enabling feature is called Postplay and had strangely been missing from the service mobile apps until today. Netflix announced that it is it it's released an update for Android, Android phone and tablets, as well as the Kindle Fire that brings post-play to these devices and will begin automatically queuing up episodes on movies at the end of the current content, like it does on the website for automatic playback. The company also confirms that it will be bringing the same feature to Chromecast in the future, but didn't announce a date. So now you can do the same thing on your phone. What, allow it to keep playing? Allow it to keep playing. I, do, I would never have that <laughs> because burn it, you go to sleep and you wake up three hours later and there goes all your bandwidth. You can't remember where you stopped watching it. That's horrible, yeah. 
Well, they have the bandwidth now, so they can do it. I hate that Andrew left. Ah. Nope. All right. There's movie buff. Um, no, 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 no. You, somebody on the IIB posted a software uh, solution that, I, if I remember correct, it was a mixer and it also had a gate built in. I thought it was you that posted it, but I may be wrong. I can't remember the name of it. It's that you, you who posted it? Somebody posted it on the IIB. I don't know who. Oh. I mean, no, uh, um, Movie, Movie Buff, Buff is saying the mixer you were alluding to was the Behringer X18. Which I have not used, so it would, yeah, that's, no. There I, was, I don't know, but, I mean, it's just, I mean, my Presonus has uh, gating on it. I don't use it. Yeah, I no, use it on the Steve, telephone Steve side. Steve was asking if there was something that mimics the DBX, and that's the first thing that came to mind that I remember. Right, that's still analog. That's not going to do it on USB. It was Tim's that was asking, I think. Oh, Tim was asking, yeah. Yeah, I was just, just agreed it was a good question. The Steve doesn't want thing, the credit for the question. The Do closest I? thing I I've come I to want... usable on USB mic, particularly with Skype, is you can enable your keyboard so that, for example, whenever Rick does his show, he can hit Alt-M to mute his microphone. So if he has to cough or sneeze or do other things. Okay, so I'm not following this. If if it doesn't do it for a USB microphone. it, it What I'm talking what? about, the mute function within Skype will work with any oh. audio input, including a USB microphone. Yeah. As long as that's the source that you're using. Yes. Yeah. Oh, this is cool. You guys a, travel. Mike never travels with a microphone. I find that very ironic. Why would I? I'm not sure. But like whenever whenever you join us from uh, your remote locations, you never travel with a microphone. Well, that's because I'm trying to be like you guys, the other guys on there who join with webcam mics. It's my opportunity to fit in. <laughs> it's but, your opportunity um, to get your own back, you mean. Yeah. <laughs> Passengers can now access free Wi-Fi at uh, Atlanta's Hatsfield Jackson International Airport. Wow. Look at they that. they dropped the $5 fee to access Wi-Fi in its, in its terminals. Oh, now, wait, Atlanta they were charging for Wi-Fi? Yeah, $5. I don't know any airport. That, I, well, all I don't the know. airports I've ever been to oh, never charge for it. Oh, on the yeah. plane, they do. Not oh, here. Oh, yeah. Okay. I it guess says now Atlanta Mayor Kasim Reed and airport officials... <clears throat> Plan to celebrate the long-awaited arrival of the amenity at the airport Wednesday, reports Kelly Yamamuchi of the Atlanta Journal. Interim airport manager believes dropping the Wi-Fi charge will alleviate a competitive disadvantage for the airport. So apparently they were charging. Five bucks. That's horrible. Horrible, horrible, horrible. I, I don't. How, how do they? How do they get away with that? I don't know. I heard, look, who, who you would want pay Wi-Fi? For, who, pay for it. Come on, Nick. This this takes money. It takes resources, and I don't see anything wrong with with uh, uh, institutions like that or places like that uh, charging for the services they provide. Oh, I do. Uh, well, you're in an airport. I mean, for God's sakes, you're not you're not staying the night. Yeah, there is Jerry Jerry saying, I remember pay toilets at airports. I've never seen it, but yeah, I remember people said you had to put a quarter in order to use the bathroom. Well, well it's just, on airplanes. I don't There's know, an I airline just, charging to use the bathroom now. I just, I just find, find it a little, I mean, p the people that would want to use the the Wi-Fi are, are in the airport for less than a half an hour sometimes. I mean, I just think that's a little ridiculous. 
I don't know. Maybe that's just, that's just my mindset. The age, the age is showing. You you used you you grew up in an era where. Well, I no, it's... I grew up where I grew up in an era where Wi-Fi is free. Yeah, I, I mean, know. I understand. I understand when you go to a hotel and you might have to pay for Wi-Fi. I get that. All right, you're staying there for. Uh, maybe you're only staying there for a day. That's your case. But you know, you're staying there for a week. I understand having to pay for the internet. Uh, I'm 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 not against paying for the internet. It's you know when you're flying into. Where was this, Atlanta? Well, no. Oh, Amnon's dying. <coughs> uh, so whatever. So no, keep going. Flying, keep going. You're flying into the Atlanta airport for a, a 45 minute layover, and and then they're going to get you for five dollars for for Wi-Fi. Well, I don't know. I mean, does everybody? Everybody pays for. I mean, Mike, you. I, I don't travel. You travel. Do you? Do you see? Do, can you get on Wi-Fi in most air, airports? Uh, originally, no. Originally, everybody charged for it, and yeah. then uh, over time, they're more and more are making it available. But there's still plenty of airports where you have to pay for Wi-Fi access. It's crazy. So it's uh, it's it's expectable. It is expe- it is expectable, and I don't know. Maybe it's just. Huh? I don't know. But but four G and LTE are going to make the point yeah. mood anyway. Yeah, Tim says put the cost in the ticket. <clears throat> well, no. the ticket goes to the airline. The Wi Fi goes to the airport. That's like adding it to the parking. Yeah. But but if you look at how much when these guys some of these guys charge what twelve ninety five for a day pass, Oof. I mean that's expensive. And yep. and these guys Are you talking about at a hotel? No, I'm talking about oh. at an airport. And um they that's just another source of revenue for these guys. Crazy. Some people will pay it. And but the other thing you have is when you get into an airport and it's free, you usually get about uh, 63K download because everybody's on it and 554 milliseconds ping time. Yeah, but you know what? You've got this. I've gotten that when I paid for internet too. Oh, if I've ever gotten that when I've paid for it, I've gotten oh, yeah. my money back. Oh, I got my money back, but the internet's still blue. I mean, it also comes down to what airport you're at. <gasps> oh, look at uh, that. that. Why didn't you get back? I had, to, I had to go downstairs and get some coffee. Oh. Okay. Well, let me Welcome you back, again. Andrew. Do the airports in New York charge for Wi-Fi? It depends what terminal. Uh, the you could buy you could buy internet there, but from what I remember now, it's complimentary Wi-Fi at, at like I, I use JetBlue, so it's free Wi-Fi and it's pretty good. I mean, I was probably a couple megs. I mean, I it was decent. Hotel. I was YouTube videos. I stayed in a hotel recently. I don't remember where was I. Oh, in Salisbury, North Carolina, where they did the internet by the government. Yeah. Best hotel internet I've ever had. It, it was actually at a hotel that used to be a Holiday Inn. Their, their, from what I understood, performance under the franchise was so bad, they lost the franchise. They <laughs> became independent, and uh, uh, the, the room was, was not mm-hmm. very good. But the, the internet was fabulous. Well, and that was provided by the hotel or by the by the hotel ice? as as part is for free, quote unquote free. I mean, we say free, but you pay for it somewhere or the Just, other. Yeah, <clears throat> but but remember, Nick, you may not know this, but uh, five years ago, whenever you checked into a hotel. If you had two laptops that the husband and wife each had a laptop, they wanted you to pay for two connections to the internet. Hey, Mike, uh, there's still. still like I've that. been to a hotel that did that. They charged per per machine. You had to like yeah, go to the front wait. desk and give them the MAC address. Mm. That's rapidly that going win, away. Which is which is a pretty modern hotel, and they were charging you per device. Yeah, that's that's pretty well going away. Yeah, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't stay there if I had a choice. Knowingly. Yeah. And this is all wireless, right? 
Yes. Oh, yeah. So you couldn't take your own router and... Well, you can get a wireless-to-wireless wireless router. Yeah, and then have your own... There's computer... There's a... I have a... When I normally go to a hotel, like, uh, we... we uh, the last few years, when we've gone away, we do... Uh, we do the, the condo thing, where you stay at a... It's a condo. It, it, it it's like, looks like a, a big hotel, but, you know, people own each condo, so each condo's got its own logon. And... You can have one device on. So what I, I do is I have the I, I have a laptop with a built-in network card, and then I have an external network card. So I connect the, my laptop to the using the internal network card, and then use the external network card to rebroadcast it, so that we can connect our phones and other devices. So just get a like a fifteen dollar USB Wi-Fi extender, and uh, there's Windows software that'll do it, and it works fine. But it's possible. <clears throat> so, Nick, your Chromebook. Yes. Google announced that its new Play Movies and TV Chrome app now has an offline mode on Chrome OS via GigaOM. This means you can watch movies and TV shows on your Chromebook even without an Internet connection. There you go. Which makes the device more appealing to those who view the Chromebook's need to have near permanent internet connectivity as a major drawback compared to regular PCs. Other than the offline mode, the new app also features info cards, which I, and it just keeps going. My what? biggest problem with the Chromebook. How can you how can you watch a movie? What does it do? It, the, the, do you download it first and then? Uh, it probably does. It, it probably buffers it like. Um... Like Google, uh, Google Play Music does. Yeah, but when you're talking about a movie, that's yeah. that's like two hours. It bu yeah, it buffers it. It'll it'll it'll. But but you while you're playing, it buffers. But they're talking about without internet. So where do you get the internet to begin you have, with? You have you have to download it at some point. You okay, have to go that's to... that's what I mean. So you yeah. can do the same thing with. Yeah, you just download it before. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, Google just announced that it's making Chromebook available in nine more countries. I did not know that it was limited in distribution. When is the Chromebook coming out with the new faster processor? I don't know, but I, I just they're going to be expensive when they come out. Yeah, I don't know. I just you know what's funny? I I asked that question online, Nick. Do you remember when I when I like last week I tweeted? I said I think I'm going to get a Chromebook. Mm -hmm. uh, what should I buy? I responded to you. You know what everyone's response was? Don't buy Wait. one. Yeah, because nobody has one. But no, I, I, Andrew, uh, you know that I'm a pretty uh, computer-intensive person. You're quite. And sad. I've had the and I've had this thing since February. And for browsing the web and hanging out, it's the best machine you could get. I mean, I charge the thing once a week. Which one do you have? The C720. Got you don't the have the, the HP one, right? No, the, no. The, this one's got a, this has got an Intel based processor, so you can run Linux without a problem. Yeah, but the HP you, one's pretty. Well, then get the HP one. Uh, but, yeah, but it's I mean, stupid. Now you're stupid. Now, <laughs> Nick, you you yes. you're working with yours. You're using it a lot. Yes, I use it. Is every it day. really? Is it slow? No, it's not slow at all because it's only the Chrome browser. I mean, there's nothing to be slow. Uh, Mike but, was asking, when are they going to come up with the new one with a faster processor? Or I mean, you don't announced? need, it. You why don't need would, a faster why, processor. Why would you want to pay a lot more for a faster processor if the you current wouldn't. one is fast enough for, for what is what you what one would do with a Chromebook? I mean, it's never going to be a desktop replacement. No, it's perfectly fine. I, 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 I don't know. I don't know, Imran. You know, I was one of those people that said that, and then I realized how people use computers. The more I talk to people, the more, more I realize that all people do is go on Facebook and go go browse on Google, and, and that's it. And check their email. That's all they're doing. Well, then in that case, power, then in that case. Thing, but if it gets a little bit more advanced and it gets a little bit more power, you know what? It could be a serious contender. At the price? $199. One one ninety nine. You have a kid. You got a seven year year old kid, eight year old kid. That you want to buy them a laptop, but you don't you don't want to spend the money. That's exactly what you buy. It's pretty looking. The laptop. Let's say the HP. 
It's pretty looking. It's disposable now. Treat it like an appliance. If it breaks, it breaks so well. I didn't spend five hundred dollars. And you know that it's limited. Your kid won't be able to install certain things. Your kid won't be or, able to do certain things on it. What I want one for is like I've gotten now where I, if I'm watching TV, particularly when I'm doing a Netflix deal like I've been doing the last few weeks, months, whatever, and I, I want to look up an actor's name, I don't want to have to get up and go over to the computer and look it up. I, I want something I can sit in my lap and just look it up. I've started using my Kindle Fire, but that's not what it's intended for. I mean, the browser on the Fire is not intended to be a, a, a it, it's an, an auxiliary browser. It's not a primary browse thing. It's pain to type on. So I want a little computer to sit in my lap that I can sit there and look up and see what Cyrus Vance's real name is. It's a great Jeff. device for that. Plus, the uh, if you've got a Chromecast, the streaming is really good, too. The one I thing, I just installed that. Ubuntu on it. It takes forever to boot, which I'm not liking. You know, I have a laptop here. Maybe I'll install Linux on it today. I wouldn't recommend it. I haven't used Linux in years. I, I feel like I, I... It's just such a pain. Like God, I spent this whole show trying to install freaking Skype, and I still can't get it. Just missing dependencies, missing dependencies. I run app get update, still missing dependencies. I'm like, Jesus. All I want to do is install Skype. I have a question for you guys. How easy is it for a normal person to install, install, let's say, Linux, let's say Ubuntu, right? Like not, not, I'm not talking like hacking a Chromebook. I'm saying they have a, they have a computer and they want, it, they want to use Linux. How easy is it to install Linux compared to installing Windows for the average user? I'd like to answer first. The installation is easy. Or second. Go ahead, Mike. Oh, wait. I, I thought you said you wanted an answer first. No, I want to answer first. Oh, okay. Go ahead. But that's okay. I'm all right. I'll be Maybe over. Not. Yes, no. I am. So, I'm sorry. So go ahead, Mike. I, I've done it both ways, Andrew. And, and if the installation goes well, it's trivial. If the installation does not go well and you don't have access to Dirtbag, you're screwed. But the installation isn't hard. The installation as with long as everything goes well. We ran just in, like, I installed it, it on just a like Windows. Computer. Yeah, but the the installation on Ubuntu now is it's not going to go wrong. It's mm -hmm. very very. I rare disagree with you. Wrong. I disagree with you. I don't even remember what happened, but um, we installed it on an Atom computer and with a nice video card and everything in it. And after I got it installed, there was something I I don't remember, Jason, what it was we did. But it took him, he and I were screwing around with this thing for about an hour before we figured out what it was. And it was just one setting, but what you got to know where to look. And if you've never had the problem before, you, you start looking around into the bowels of, of yeah, Linux. Yeah, but Mike, also, when was this? Things Six months ago. What? Six months ago. What were you installing? Mm. Ubuntu. I don't know. I've, I've installed Ubuntu plenty of times. I've never had a problem. I, I don't know anything about Linux. I don't. I don't right. want to come off like I know stuff about Linux, but I've right. never had a problem with it. Right. Which goes back to what I originally said. If it goes well, it's trivial. The problem is, is just installing software is such a pain. Like I still cannot. I, I still cannot get uh, Skype installed. I went to Skype's website. I've got Ubuntu twelve twelve uh, twelve twelve dot oh four. It's on the Skype download page. I download it and it says it's not compatible. It's just, it's just stupid stuff like that. Jason, what's he doing wrong? <laughs> I mean, I don't see what I... I, I, I don't know. Uh, Skype's got for download. 1204. Well, I don't know if you know, Nick, but Dirtbag and Chat... He's a Linux expert, yeah. He's very much an expert. Yeah. It's just it, it, every, time I, every time I want to try to, to learn it and use it, I just... I just end up stop using it because I, like, all I want right now is to just do, uh, to uh, just get Skype on it. That's that 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 is my purpose. Just c cannot get it. It's just a real pain. Just concentrate and. Oh, I spent forty. I spent like two and a half hours on it last night, and now I've been been working on it for the last probably half an hour. Just, just annoying. So, if I want one of these uh, 
C720s. Should I go buy one now and not wait for the faster processor? Um, you won't need the faster processor. <clears throat> I'm telling I mean, you, you my, won't my, need the, the faster those processor. Broadwell chips, you know, with Computex, they announce a bunch of these Intel Broadwell chips, and those things are looking amazing. They do look amazing, you but you won't need it for the Chromebook. There's no apps no that they're, they're. What? No fan, fanless. Yeah, I'm just you, Mike. There's nothing you can do on the Chromebook that you would need power for. I mean, it's a web browser. Okay. So does it not have any other applications on it at all? No, there are other any app that you can get on the Chrome Store. You can get on the Chromebook. What does that mean? What like what? Well, give me an, what? What do you want? I don't know. What do you have installed on yours? Well, I have nothing installed now. What did you have installed on yours? Um, other than Chrome browser. I don't even remember because I didn't do anything else on it. Because you can do the word processing through Google Docs. That's right? what I'm saying. You, you don't you, you don't need anything else. I mean, r realistically, for what the device is used for, I didn't install anything else. I had a few like add-on apps I was playing with, but I'm I didn't need anything else. And I and I'm not a I'm a pretty user uh, user uh, computer intensive person too. So. I, I I don't know if if I can get used to using it, and I I mean you, Mike, you know how I am about this stuff. It anybody can use this thing. It's it's my I got we got my father one. He he loves it. Lightweight. He charges it like once a month. Perfect. <clears throat> I'm gonna probably get one. Yeah, I posted a link into the one in chats. The Acer C720, the two gig version is fine for uh, <clears throat> uh, for for what I think you'd be doing on it. I mean, that was the only thing that I really liked about the what was that Apple I had? The uh, Air, the MacBook Air. It was very small. It was very convenient <clears throat> to use. I mean, I, I was I was pretty happy with that. Sixteen gigabyte, thirty-two gigabyte. I wouldn't get the thirty-two. You won't use it because all your files are stored on a uh, drive. What is this sixteen gigabyte? Is that the drive or the RAM or what? No, that's the the SSD. That is the SSD. The, oh, the flash memory. Yeah. Okay. And why would you not want to do the thirty-two? Because you won't use it. There's nothing you could. The, 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 people, somebody else was saying that. Bruce, when when I got this, Bruce told me I should wait for the 32 gigabyte version. But you, there's there's nothing to store on it. It's a web browser. You're so you don't be, think there might be some applications that would want to store files on it? No, all of the applications are in the cloud. I mean, there honestly is nothing to store in the Chromebook unless you're putting videos on it. But even the the music streams through Google Play Music. I mean, honestly, th there really is nothing you need to store on it but the OS. Maybe a few Word doc files that you want to keep saved, but Google uh, uh, Docs, use, you can do offline editing with that. Gmail, you can do offline viewing. I mean, honestly, you really don't need anything. I'm reading some comments in, in Amazon on it, and it says that we, the question, some of them are really dumb, but uh, the question they ask is, all I do is check email, pay bills, and go on Facebook. Is this good for what I need? Perfect. And uh, the answers are, Chromebooks are perfect for this. You'll get the best web browser experience without the need to worry about viruses, updates, or other crap that just gets in the way. Mm -hmm. Next response is, is that true, Audrey? Notebooks don't get viruses or other crap? That would be great for my mom. Answer, yes, exactly. Question. Answer, actually. Actually, they can get viruses. People just don't make them for the Chromebook since their user base is so small. Next answer. I, I disagree with that. But if you get a virus, you can just reset it to factory and it's gone. Since all the user settings are stored in the cloud, it looks exactly the same after a reset. Now, I think there's something to be said for that. Uh-oh. What? I just, <laughs> screwed up, I just screwed up my Chromebook. Uh-oh. I have just uh, reset it. I can't. I can't turn it off now. Hold the power button five seconds. I, I did. It doesn't turn off. Uh -oh. <clears throat> Take the battery out. There's no battery. 
What, what does it operate off of? Well, th- th- I can't take the battery out. There's got to be a reset button. Uh, I don't know. What did I do? I, I, I was in Ubuntu, and I closed the lid, and I guess it didn't like that. <clears throat> what happened if you press the power button? I just I just said I did. And? It didn't turn off. Let's see. There's got to be a keyboard command to do it. It says, is there a big difference in performance from having only 2 gig of RAM as opposed to 4? And the first answer is I have the 2 gig version, and it does start <laughs> to bog down when you have a dozen or so windows open. I'm an IT manager and use this as a second laptop, and I'm fine with 2 gig. That being said, as web pages get bigger and new features are added to the Chrome OS, you may want far more memory. You may want more memory later. Unless you're a power user, I think you'll be fine with two gigabytes. I'm a power user and I'm fine with two gigabytes. And let's see what else he says. Uh, how does it work for YouTube? YouTube plays well at times. There are faint stutters at 720p, but that may be due to my less than blazing internet connection. Yeah. Okay, I got it to turn off. How'd you do it? I just held on the power button for like 25 seconds. Right, YouTube running out players tend to start freaking out. So you couldn't, that that turned it off or? Yeah, it turned it off. So there was no way for you to wake it up, kind of. Well, well, it was like woken up, the screen was on and there was a mouse, but it didn't move. If that doesn't work, then that's a problem and I'm going to have to redo re- reinstall it again and get rid of Linux. I can't even do I can't even install Skype so it doesn't even matter. Can uh, you can you do GFQ chat on the 720? Yeah. Cuz Chrome just well, even you can do any chat cuz Chrome is uh has flash built in by default. Okay. I'm telling and you like you will enjoy this anymore. computer. What? The chat is in flash. It's uh HTML5 I, now. Yeah, but you you can do flash. I mean, it does yeah. by default. Is there any sort of a video output connector on it? HDMI, and it works uh, flawless. I use it every week. So you could, I mean, this would be a good little computer for if Andrew wanted to do Leo's chat thing, where he had chat scrolling by on a monitor behind him. This would be a good little deal to have to do that. Yeah, I, I use it for on the radar. That's how I show the videos and the stories. I do it on the Chromebook, hook it up via HDMI. So oh, you're fun. coming out of the 720 going into your AverMedia HDMI capture card into Wirecast? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm running a, an HDCP stripper in the middle. Right. Which I'm not sure if it does or doesn't work directly, but yeah, it works. <clears throat> I'm very happy with it. It's got a it's got an SD card slot. It's got a USB three slot. It's it's a pretty good laptop. I would it tell is, any, I would tell anybody. It's to buy serving it. the purpose that you yeah. need. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Movie Buff was asking in chat about thoughts on Thunderbolt <laughs> audio interface units. I I haven't used any of them. I don't have anything with Thunderbolt on it. The only things that I know of are Mac and and Lenovo that have commitments to the Thunderbolt. Protocol and none of my Lenovo computers has Thunderbolt on it. I will tell you that I'm a member of a community of of, of music recording engineers, and these guys were diehard Apple fans from the time uh, Pro Tools was originally released because it was originally released on Apple only. And, And I mean, these guys were. You couldn't budge them. They, they, I mean, it just worked. They, they didn't crash. This is where Apple got a lot of its reputation because in the music industry, these guys are using Apple computers with Pro Tools to do uh, million-dollar recording sessions, and and they worked well. These guys are really upset with the entire Thunderbolt implementation. They're saying that it's awkward, it's expensive, and it's confusing. So I, I don't know. This is very odd. Um, Microsoft recently announced plans to reintroduce the start menu to Windows in an upcoming version of the operating system. 
While the plan was to roll out an update to Windows 8.1 and offer the start menu later this year, it seems like this is no longer the case. Now Microsoft is reportedly looking to release the start menu with Windows 9, <laughs> which is expected in April 2015. Windows 8 and 8.1 have faced a boatload of criticism and hatred, partly due to the removal of the start button and start menu. The restoration of a visible start button on the taskbar was one of the key features of the 8.1 update released back in October of 2013. And I don't know that it did that much. Well, no, they haven't added the start, start menu yet. Right. I'm talking about the start button. The start button, yeah, but it does nothing. No. You know. So did did I understand you to say they've decided not to do that? Not to do it until Windows 9. They were supposed to release to add the start menu in a in an update to to 8, but now they decided they're going to wait until 2015. Yeah, they were adding it in update 2. That's supposed to come out in August. But uh, I think it's I think it's a smart call that they that they shouldn't add it in 8 and they should add it in 9 because they have to market nine as a fix for eight. They have to the make they're money. Gonna do that, they're going to you know bring back the start menu and they're going to bring back some features that you know we we want in Windows in desktop. But then aren't they going to make Windows eight an orphan operating system? <laughs> yep. Well, it's going to become what Vista was. And that was so totally unnecessary. You know, it was this was Steven Sanofsky's big vision and. He's no longer at the company, and the company now has taken a different direction. Steven Sinofsky wanted to force his way in what he envisioned Microsoft to be, rather than slowly, you know, add, adding in every department. So when they made Windows, it was his vision. That that it was all or nothing in his mind. Well, but it's coming and, and, out April 2015, so it's not too far away. Okay, <clears throat> I can wait. Uh, but in that regard, I, I found an interesting video. Dave's Computer Tips had an interesting video that I watched just before the show today. I'll post a link to it in the chat room. And what the video is about is it's kind of a comedy version of kids' reactions to old computers. And I only watched a few seconds of it, but the part that I clicked on showed these little kids trying to push buttons on CRT monitors. I saw that. They didn't understand what They were what sitting there doing. touching the CRT monitor trying to push on things. So it looks like that Microsoft is correct and that that's the way things are going to move, but I think that they just were too early and too inflexible <clears throat> on their implementation. Well, I, I, think, I think the new UI is a beautiful UI, but the problem is how do you implement that on desktop? You can't. And the, no, well, and that's another I don't thing. Think, I don't think the answer is touching your, your laptop. I don't think that's the answer. The other thing I saw, what is this? Oh, Scandal. If you were watching, you watch Scandal, you notice they were using Windows phones. Yeah, they all use Windows phones. And it's the first real exposure I've had to even Windows phones. And I got to tell you, it, it looks great on a telephone. It's a great, it's a great operating system. The phones are phenomenal. The hardware is great. Everything is great about it except for the ecosystem. It's not advanced yet. Yeah. They have the best which cameras in the business in phones. The, which phone? Uh, the Lumias, uh, the higher-end Lumias, a 920, 928, 1020. Better than Apple's camera? There's nothing that beats the 1020. There's nothing on the market that, that beats it or can beat it. It's 40 megapixels. The thing's se image sensor is insane. The 928 is better than Apple also. Samsung are bringing it, Samsung are bringing it at a range of um, camera phones, they're calling them, aren't they? And they, they've got very good specs on their cameras. I'm looking at it. And the Lumia 1020 is Windows only? What do you mean? <clears throat> it's a Windows operating system phone? It's Windows Phone 8, yeah. Interesting. Because they've got a 1020, a 1520. Yeah, 1520 is gigantic. It's like six inches. And 
And these are LTE? All of them, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, but going back to what you were saying, Andrew, I, I, don't, I don't think a touch screen on the desktop is going to be is going to happen with with a monitor. No, it's not. Absolutely not. Uh, and, and it's not what people want. Right. I mean, even on a laptop, it's stretching it. I don't like to. I don't want to touch the laptop. On a tablet, it's, diff it's a different story. But with Microsoft. They have to get away from the Windows 8 name. They have to get away with it, and this is the best way to do it. All right, I have they a have question. To in this platform and, and, and just totally forget about it. With, with pad computers having so much acceptance in the marketplace and a laptop computer being only slightly larger in many cases than a pad computer, why is touchscreen so desirable on a pad and so undesirable on a laptop? I don't know that it's undesirable on the laptop. I think it's still usable on a laptop. But on the, the problem that I think a lot of people would have or are having with a monitor, a monitor is not being held at arm's length. A monitor but, normally you know, is much farther, and you, you have to, to go forward. You have to lean forward to do anything, and the bigger the monitor the father it is from you so it's it's just not it's not practical now if you start uh thinking about those monitors that you see now in many of the shows where it's built into the desk i mean into the table and and it's in front of you where you can reach yeah you can do that but uh, a, a traditional monitor that sits on top of the desk it's impossible. It's it's just in many cases it's actually impossible to to do anything to. I have a couple of customers that have those HP's touch screen and they they just put a mouse and a keyboard on it and disable the the touch screen so and the occasional I mean one of my customers <laughs> didn't know and every now and then they would touch the screen to show something say see right there <laughs> And something would happen, and they say something is happening to my machine. I went, and that's what they were doing. So it's it's. Uh, but for a laptop, um, you still hold it in your lap. You don't put it on the disc, an arm's length away, so you can still touch if you wanted to. Whether right, well, let me throw mm -hmm. a uh, let me throw a little curve here. And everybody put their thinking caps on here. I don't have an opinion on this. I'm curious. In in many ways, personal computing has gone almost all laptops anyway. I don't know how many people are buying desktop computers. A lot. You think so? No, I know so. For personal use? Um, both. Maybe for personal, it's more laptops. You're right. I'm, I mean, you, in, in offices like our office, even though... We use all laptops in our office. We've got like 50 laptops, but they all have docking stations to make them into desktops. But how many actual tower desktops are being sold today compared percentage-wise compared to five years ago? No, now don't compare. Obviously, absolutely less, but still a lot of them are being sold. Now, having said that, assuming that a lot of the stationary computers, for lack of a better term, are being sold in business environments, how many of those businesses are likely to have applications that would benefit from a touch screen? Example, point hmm. of sale uh, devices. I would think that touch screen there would be a tremendous resource. Yeah. You don't have to train people for programs. I mean, one of the benefits of getting that we've said that, that people, elderly people really take to an iPad much more quickly than they do almost any other kind of computer because all they've got to do is touch it, touch it, touch it. Yeah, we like touching. <laughs> Mike, you're giving it away. Oh, well. Um, I wanted to go back to something I saw Movie Buff saying when we came in, and he said he was watching... And on Nissan Communications, and there was no uh, K 
Kathy logged into the chat here? It's I don't birthday? believe that. Is today your birthday? I can't believe that. Huh? Yeah, today's today my birthday. birthday. What? Well, and, happy birthday. Yeah, thank you. And Why didn't you say about, anything? Happy That's birthday, the, Amnon. Why didn't you tell us? It's my birthday today. Well, yeah, and they tell us halfway through the show. Well done. Well, well, happy birthday um, to you. You don't look a day over 50. Liar. Mo <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Movie Buff was saying that he was watching it on NissanCommunications.com and there was no chat. You should be watching it on the Roku app. I'm, 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 I'm just wondering where, I, I mean, is, yeah, he's still here. Um, so where were you, where did you go to, I mean, if you go to NissanCommunications.com, you can't watch it. You have to go to NissanCommunications.com and let's say click on watch well, I'm sure live that's he, I'm sure that's what he meant. channels. The what? said, I'm sure that's what he meant. Well, there is chat the there, though. Uh, is it the right chat is the question. It is the right chat because uh, what happens is when, let's see, uh, before I put my foot in my mouth, if I go to watch live, it should be the same thing because we're, <clears throat> we're copying it over. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, before before the start the start of each show, a a cron job is always copying the show's page to the live section. So if you go to live watch live, you will get the page that you would get when you go to the channel. And this is why I said, hmm. Oh. Well, you see, now... Yeah, that's that's what it'll be, right, after, after we copy it, which happens a few minutes before the show starts. Okay, that, that explains it. All right. So who logged in? I, I, I don't believe that Kathy is logged else, in. Somebody logged in as Kathy. How? I have no... Well, you, know, you can do a lot of stuff. I, I got to find out. Hold on. <laughs> Why does he not believe it? That's just the way he is. So currently I'm attempting to... Um, uh, fix the long boot time on Ubuntu. So I got a tech question, Mike. Okay. I can't. I can't do a Windows update on this laptop that I just turned on. It keeps giving me an error code. What's the error code? Uh, eight zero 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 f f f f. <laughs> How dare you! And it says get help with this error code, and then you put that in, and that error code does not show up. What version, what operating system is it? Windows 7. Uh, check the time and date and make sure you haven't lost the time and date. No, nope, time and date are fine. Make sure the, the uh, time zone is correct. Yep, that's fine. And... The um, is it only is it failing Windows Update completely or just on one, the one update? No, it's not even downloading it. It can't download it. What's the update number? It, there's a there's a few updates. None of them are downloading. All right, so Windows Update is failing, not the individual update. No, no. Is it connected to the internet? Just select one update and see if it'll do one on its own. It may be a, a, one of the ones that are in that <clears throat> um, collection isn't isn't downloading and stopping the whole lot from downloading. And when's the last time you rebooted the computer? Uh, I just re I rebooted it. I, I installed 
uh, I uninstalled some stuff and then it did a bunch of reboots and then uh, said Windows is doing whatever. Well, now, if it's doing an automatic update in the background, it'll do that to you. You know, but I don't if think it, it's doing an automatic update. It's not, it sets it just download. Sits, it's not able to download. So when I go to download, it says can, uh, Windows cannot download. And sometimes it, that doesn't sound like the same error message, but sometimes that happens whenever you try to manually update a computer and Windows updates running in the background. Huh. I wonder if it is doing that. You can yeah. go through Task Manager and see. Or you can just stuff. look down there and see if the icon is on. Yeah, it's Jessica's Lenovo. She has a Lenovo T61 from a couple of years ago, and she hasn't mm -hmm. turned it on in about a year and a half. I just let it run for a little while. Uh, didn't you say you were going to install Linux on it? I was thinking about it. I wouldn't even bother. Wow, doing you can buy it right now for two hundred bucks. This laptop, <clears throat> brand new, it was like fourteen hundred dollars. Why are you doing updates then? Uh, I don't know if I'm going to install Linux on it yet. Andrew, okay. somebody somebody put the fix for MS Fix It in the chat. I've had a problem with the same thing, uh, Andrew. When you haven't updated for a long time, it's because there's so many there. There's one that it's trying to download that it needs a, a, an earlier one or something like that. So just oh, select, yeah, yeah. select like 10 at a time and then just do the, those 10. And if you've got a reboot, fine, do it that way. You'll get through it eventually. Let's see. This was a great well, laptop. Is, don't, don't leave it till you've got 80, uh, 80 updates to do. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's probably what it is. I had a, a computer here on the bench from a customer. That it was a XP, and mm -hmm. it was. It said that there is a an update. So I said, "Okay, go ahead and update it." So it went through, went through, went, 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 and said, "Okay, done. Do you want to reboot?" I said, "Yeah." And I went and sat down and did some work, came back, and it says there's an update. I said, boy, they must have not turned on that machine in a long time. So I said, yeah, go ahead and do it. It went ahead. I was working. I looked. It finished. said, okay, upload, uh, update completed. Reboot. Yeah. Sit down. After the third time, I said, well, now wait a second. Let me look. So it, I, I went to custom, and I looked at what update it was, and I went into the... Uh, add remove programs with updates and it was already in there and it just kept on coming up. It was already installed, but it kept on coming up as though it's <laughs> not there. Windows does that all the time. So it just hide it and that's it. But it was. <laughs> hey, uh, Amron. Yeah. What does suspend mean in Linux? Is Sus that sleep? Suspend? Yeah, it says like, it says restart. Uh, shut down, suspend. Does that mean sleep? That's that's got nothing to do with Linux. That's the machine. That's like sleep. Yes. I don't so know. That's what I'm asking. Is it like sleep? It it's got to be. Uh, okay. d d ask J Jason. There it is. Jason, you heard what? Uh, I I never installed Ubuntu. Uh, it does. Does it have suspend in? Oh, that boots so Ubuntu. Cool. No. It does. It says it just says sleep, restart, suspend. Are my options. What other options are there? Like hibernate, perhaps. I, I don't know what it is. Yeah. No, I, I mean, what? Oh, so you sleep, sleep, restart. Or no, I'm sorry. Shut down, restart, suspend. Yeah, I would say suspend versus hibernate. Well, there's no hibernate. It's just suspend. So that's what it means. That right, suspend well, is like suspend. hibernate. <clears throat> nope. Oh, all it does is log me out. It says that it saves to disk and shuts down the computer. Yeah, it's not shutting down. It's just uh, no, it actually. may take time. It does. Do you have a hard drive light? No, no. What happens is it, it just logs me out and it doesn't turn the turn off. But that's fine now because now I figure I got it. So when you close the lid, the screen turns off, but it stays on. So I fixed the problem. What did you do? What was it? It needed to be shut down, not restarted. Oh, mm, that's not unusual. <laughs> uh, on Windows 7, yeah, if you restart, it does not install updates. You know how you have the shield on the shutdown? If, yeah. and, and if yeah, you shut down, it, it, uh, it 
applies the updates, if you do a restart, <laughs> it doesn't do it. This is why I use a Mac. <gasps> I'm now glad they have this. that because sometimes you want to restart the computer and not wait an hour for uh, for hundred updates to uh, to apply. So it's nice that the restart does not apply them. You said something, Steve? No, no. Oh, uh, let's see. <laughs> Listen to this, Apple CEO Tim Cook during his keynote, said that around 130 million customers have purchased their first Apple device in the last 12 months. He <laughs> states, many of these customers were switched from Android. They had bought an Android phone by mistake and then had sought a better experience and a better life. He added that almost half of those who have purchased an iPhone in China since December, have switched from Android. However, it is worth noting that iPhones were not actually available in China until December. Yeah, and guess what the only smartphone available was? What? Android. <laughs> so, of course, half of the people that... <laughs> and they did over. it by mistake, yeah. When pre-orders begin, so it is unclear how much of the device's popularity there is simply down to the novelty factor rather than a burning desire to flee from Android. Yeah, uh, you know, that, that uh-oh. What happened here? Skype stopped working. Oh, shoot. I didn't yep. see that. Thank you, Microsoft. Yeah, thank you, Microsoft. Absolutely. Yeah, you just uh, make our life every right. single day. If you'd like to join in the conversation, by all means, no, I mean, give us a ring. It's 919-518-9773. Or if you have Skype, give us a call on Computers 2K Voice. I wonder if I can add the group at once. Let's see. Uh... No, I don't think so. That now may mess up. Wait, I'm going to do something else. Hold on, guys. Steve, talk about something. Talk about something. Okay. It's, um, there was something that did come in my RSS feeds that I, uh, I looked at and thought, you've got to be kidding me. Um, the Movie Picture Association of America. Um, they're saying that the consumer right to resell online videos would kill innovation. Now, try not to get too angry while I read this. Um, this week, the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on the Judiciary Subcommittee Intellectual Property and the Internet held a hearing on the issue of digital resales. In other words, whether consumers should be allowed to sell digital videos, music files and software they purchased previously. Proponents of the rights to resell digital goods want the first sale doctrine to apply in the digital domain as well. However, this argument is meeting fierce resistance from the entertainment industries who see this right as a threat to their online business models. I, I'll try and keep the, the, my own viewpoints out of this. Uh, for example, the recording labels previously pointed out that MP3s are simply too good to resell as they don't deteriorate in, in quality. Responding to the hearing in Washington, the MPAA also voiced its critique to the plans. According to the movie studios, digital releases would hamper innovation, increase prices and decrease the availability of online film. In their view, it would undo most of the innovation the Internet brought. It does continue on and I'll put a link uh, to the article in. But yeah, talk about um, blinded uh, and only a, a one, one view um, one viewpoint that's quite shocking, really. Well, I mean, that, that's, that's an interesting discussion. There. So, how would you go about selling an MP3? Your your copy, your MP3 that you purchased. How do you sell that? Well, there is a a, a site already called Redigi, I think, isn't there? Um, 
just a second. It's actually in here somewhere. I can essentially make copies of my MP3s and just say that that's a copy. That's the original copy that I'm selling. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, I'm pretty sure it's called Redigi. Um, I'm just trying to scrolling through the document, trying to find the the name of the the company. I think it's called Redigi, and that's exactly what they do. You you can sell. Um, your MP3s, but obviously you, you've got to agree to the fact and, and state the fact that you've uh, deleted any copies that you may have. Yeah. But, it, you know, it, it it goes back to the fact that uh, it, for 100 years, what what you buy is your own, and you should be able to resell that as a first sale doctrine. Why all of a sudden should now the internet is here? Why all of a sudden should something that's digital not be your property to sell? It's ridiculous. Download the Read Digi app to unlock your digital wealth. So you can sell all your MP3s. You do ebooks, software, music, and audiobooks. If it works for um, for anything else that that's, uh, you can physically hold in your hand, why is it shouldn't it be something that you can physically store on your hard drive? What's the difference? So fifty nine cents for used uh, music. That's not a bad deal. Why would you pay for it new? I mean, it's as long as it's the same file. But I mean, but in reality, though, you're just now you're you're it's almost like you're 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 bootlegging, right? Like you could essentially resell and resell and resell. And you could. But how can they prove that you didn't delete it? Well, they can't. Well, that's the exactly. problem. They can't prove it. It's got to be on your honor, isn't it? But like in the old days, it was always you're innocent until proven guilty. Now, the assumption is you're guilty and you're not going to do what, what is expected of you, which is, you know, completely turn the tables. I, I see there's going to be a lot of opposition to this uh, from the, the movie uh, and the, the recording industry. Um, but at the end of the day... Um, if you do build up a, a tremendous movie collection, you build up, you know, TV collection, whatever that you've actually purchased that's digital, why should you not be able to leave that or, or pass that on to your your children? I mean, the problem right now is that we're in this weird transition period where physical media still exists, but in a couple of years, you know, in 10 years, it'll still be here, but not to the capacity, you know, not to the level that we have it now. I don't know anyone that's going and buying CDs anymore. Uh, no, I, mean, I mean, I just don't understand who's buying a physical CD. <laughs> well, it's the same with Blu-rays. Blu-rays, uh, um, because there's so much stuff that's being able to be streamed now and, and you can actually get from digital, it, it's why on earth would you um, um, bother with buying a DVD? Well, if you can get it streamed on. in that good quality, why bother? Why bother filling up a shelf when you can have it on your hard drive? If you want to buy a CD with a WAV file, WAV version, not MP3 garbage, then you have to buy a CD. I don't know of any sites that have a good, good catalog of WAV files to purchase. Steve? Sorry, I unclicked my microphone. Um, say that again, Mike. I was, I was um, distracted. Let's suppose you want to go buy a... Uh, uh, CD because um, you, you want to buy WAV files, not MP3s. How can you do that but for buying a CD? Well, you can. That's the problem. A lot of people that want a good quality would want to download it in FLAC, uh, which is a lossless format, but it, I mean, fair wave. enough, they're still big. But you can't do that in, in many instances. And, and who wants to be happy or who would be happy with a 128K file when you want to listen to that perhaps at home on your hi-fi, the minimum you would want is, well, the maximum that you can get, which is 320K. And Correct. to some people, even that is, you can hear the difference between the two. Most of the things that I've recorded and digitized, I've left as waves rather than converting them into flak because it's just, you know, just had to go and buy another hard drive, that's all. But I've got all my, my entire music collection now is on one hard, one terabyte hard drive. Right. It just squeezed onto it. So if I did buy any more, then I'd, I'd have problems. But you know, now that we've got four terabyte hard drives, so it, it isn't it isn't a problem anymore. But the, the <clears> thought <throat> of not being able to leave that to to somebody um, when I die, I mean, I would love to be able to leave that to you know my sister, for instance, and say, look, 
you know, I'm going to leave this to you. This is my entire music collection that I've had for the last whatever, how many years. But legally, I wouldn't be able to do that. Well, but who's going to pay attention to that? Well, no, true, but um, it makes you wonder that um, with all this, you know, NSA watching and in, in, in whatever else, who's to say that they don't start thinking, hang on, we can, um, we can make some money here, charge people another three, four times for, for the same digital content. That's what they want. Well, you know the government would never spy on you without your permission. Absolutely not. not. And talking about the government, the FBI said it was making national a pilot program it tried out in 12 locations earlier this year that offers up to $10,000 for information leading to the arrest of anyone who intentionally aims a laser at an aircraft. Mike? What? No comments about that? I, I missed what you said. Oh, I missed part of it. I said the FBI today said it was making national a pilot program it tried out in 12 locations earlier this year that offers up to $10,000 for information leading to an arrest of anyone who intentionally aims a laser at an aircraft. So why are you asking me? I don't do that well, that often. As, no, as an, as an attorney. I mean, my first thought is you better watch out who you hang out with because people will do a lot for ten thousand dollars if you heartbeat. are doing this. I mean, in a heartbeat. Yeah. So that that's that's a good thing to do. Well, what what does that does that mean? A, a laser that is capable of destruction. Does that mean a pointer laser that you use for PowerPoint presentations? What does that mean? Uh, I think uh, PowerPoint presentation. Uh, pointer is just as bad as anything else. Uh, that's going to knock an airplane out of the sky? Mike, if you're sitting, you, you're, you, you sit to the cockpit. If you see a laser up mm. on, the, on your ceiling in the, in the cockpit, are you thinking, is this uh, somebody doing a uh, a presentation, or is this a gun pointed at me? That laser sitting from, from ground shooting at an airplane would never show up in the cockpit. I don't know. It won't go about 40 feet. And then it diffuses. It's, it's, just, it's not a precision instrument, highly focused instrument like they're talking about. Well, on, on the, the, the laser that I have on my rifle will go a lot farther than that. Oh, yeah. But but compare that laser with a little tiny pocket deal. Well, the the point here is that you cannot, um, you cannot feel you you can't feel good about seeing a laser point in your cockpit. And I think I think this is a good thing that they're doing. Right. Well, we, we don't want any terrorists violating laws by shining lasers. Yeah, there. right. <laughs> I mean, they could get in trouble with the law if they did that. Speaking of lasers, did you guys see the uh, International Space Station is now using uh, lasers to transmit data to the ground? No. They're, um, <clears throat> the the, the codename for it is OPALS, O-P-A-L-S, um, and it stands for... Optical payload for laser comm science, and um, instead of using its normal uh, radio wave technology to transmit data, it can now do uh, laser it, the from the ground. There's an antenna on some mountain in California, and um, it shoots a laser beam <clears throat> at this connector, and then the on, on the International Space Station, the space station connects to it and tracks it. And it can do it can do almost fifty megabytes uh, a second at a full capacity. So uh, wow. it's much easier for them to get data down because it used to take uh, used to take much longer. They used they sent a hundred forty eight second video <clears throat> in three point five seconds, and if they were to do that over the radio uh, based technology, it would take them over ten minutes. 
So it's uh it's good. Well, okay, <clears throat> but and I don't know anything about that story or anything about that laser. <clears throat> But I just a couple of random thoughts. One is that if they put an updated RF system in and not an R updated laser system, they would still have better throughput than what they have now. And that is, they were making an upgrade, so they went with laser instead of RF. So to say that it's the laser technology per se that improved the throughput, I think, is a little silly. There I didn't are, say that. No, no, but I'm just, I said these are random thoughts. And the other thing is that there is a, a potential benefit. And again, I don't know. People in chat would know more about it than I do. But there also seems to be another benefit of using laser technology in that it's very directional. And the signal is much less likely to be intercepted by um, mm -hmm. anyone, uh, any other governments. Now, you can have directional RF antennas, but they're not generally as directional as a laser is, that a laser is direct line of sight. Right. So to intercept the laser signal, you'd have to have a receiver in between you the are transmitter actually, and the receiver. You are actually intercepting the, the transmission at that point. You have to break it from the other side will not, will not get anything because you can just sit a little bit to the side and get it like RF. You have to go right there into the beam. So that might be part of it, too, is the ability to control the distribution of the signal. I'm guessing at that. that the reason I say I'm guessing at that is because there may be military technologies for concentrating signals, um, RF signals, into a line of sight sort of thing. But I would think that the radiators for doing that would be, uh, <clears throat> would be pretty large. There has to be. I mean, th there must have been a reason that they went with... Uh laser over like you said rs there's got to be some reason well keep in mind what fiber is uh the, well yeah and after it get, uh, once it hits the um once the data gets to the base they are they're using fiber optic to get it back to their their computers so uh, it's, yeah. it's 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 good that now that because um the, the, the mars rover does some like using a bunch of uh uh, relays and stuff, it does like 60-something K a second. It's pretty horrendous. So maybe the, the, I, I, what I'm assuming is that they're testing this with the space station, but they plan on being able to use uh, the laser stuff to <clears throat> maybe contact the Mars rover because it takes them forever to get stuff. Um, Steve? Hello. Say whatever you want to say about the EU. Well, can I really? <laughs> I'm, 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 this, this here, I mean, tells me, boy, they're doing the right way. The European Commission and 180 companies and research organizations under the umbrella of EU robotics have launched the world's largest civilian research and innovation program in robotics covering manufacturing, agriculture, health, transport, civil security, and households. The initiative called SPARC is the EU's industrial policy effort to strengthen Europe's position in the global robotics market, 60 billion a year by 2020. Now, here's the important stuff. This initiative is expected to create over 240,000 jobs in Europe and increase Europe's share of the global market to 42%. And that's a boost of $4 billion per year. The European Commission will invest $700 million, and EU Robotics will invest $2.1 billion. Why was this not done in the States? I mean, 240,000 jobs. It sounds like the whole thing is, is not a drop in the ocean in any way, shape, or form. It's they're really um, going to throw out the, uh, everything and its dog at it. Yeah. I hadn't, I hadn't heard of this, actually, but um, I dare say I'll be getting something in the RSS feeds if you've, if you've uh, had something in yours. Now, what's the difference between the European Union and the European Commission? <clears throat> Uh, the union is uh, is the union of all the countries, so all the countries that are in it, and the commission is. Um, I think it's uh, 
Isn't that the control of them? I, I, I have no idea. I'm asking. I have no idea. I, I, I don't really know either. So rather than just stab at a guess, uh, the best, best I say, I don't know either. No. Jorvik would know. Uh, Mike, if he was out there and called in, he would know. He's into uh, this kind of thing a lot more than I am. And where else? The British government wants life in prison for hackers who cause disruption to computer networks, resulting in loss of life or threat to the country's national security. From the article, it says the UK government will seek to amend the 1990 <clears throat> Computer Misuse Act to ensure sentences for attacks on computer systems fully reflect the damage they cause. Currently, the law provides for a maximum sentence of 10 years imprisonment for those who commit the offense of impairing a computer. A new aggravated offense of unauthorized access to a computer will be introduced into the Computer Misuse Act by the government carrying far longer sentences. Um, it, it's the... I, I don't know, I mean... In over here, I mean, you can do a, uh, you can be accused and, and, and convicted of DUI, and get not so harsh of a sentence, and do something a lot simpler, and get a harsher sentence. Which Isn't makes no sense. Yeah. I mean, here it is. Somebody breaks into a system, you know, I mean, you can break into the power grid and do so. And even if you didn't cause anything, you broke into a power grid that could in turn <coughs> cause loss of life if people who are on machines and all that lose power. If they, did not, if they did not listen to Nick and buy that and bought that UPS, that is. Oh, yeah, so, uh, so many while other the, laws, while the power grid is down, I can use my computer for all of well. 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, I mean, uh, Steve, you said what? It's like so many other laws now that it, it's written so, so broadly that it, it, it could be um, used nefariously. And you, you can't tell me that they're not going to misuse this. I, I don't have a problem with somebody if, if they if they hacked into, say, like the air traffic control system uh, and caused a plane to come down. Right. Or, you know, it could be deemed that they caused a place to come down. If it's beyond any reasonable doubt, then I don't have a problem with it. But you can guarantee that they'll use this for nefarious purposes um, and they'll be imprisoning people that, um, like has happened in the past, where you get somebody with Asperger's syndrome or, or other um, mental illnesses that tr just try to hack in for the sake of it to see if they can. And they'll then say, oh, so-and-so was inconvenienced, whatever, we need to make an example of you. That's where this law is going to be abused. Well, but the thing is, I, I, I mean, and this is my opinion, I don't think anybody should uh, hack into systems that they have no business getting into. I don't either, but the problem is, um, who defines the, ha the word hacking? I mean, if somebody's... Yeah, I mean, if, if your system's got a vulnerability and I get into it, I, is that hacking? Um. Yes. I, is it now? Is yeah. Even, you, why, uh, I mean, let's let's wait. Wait. Hold it a second. If you are at home and the door is not locked, and a stranger walks in, is the door open or is the door not locked? No, the door is closed, but it's not locked. I I I still think this is breaking and entering. Even though you what did is, not break the door. <clears throat> what if the door is cracked open? Is that still breaking and entering? I don't. I mean, it, l let me ask you this. If you go to some uh, a strange house and the door is cracked, are you going to walk in? You, Nick. Uh, no, uh, no, not, not me, Nick. Exactly. Because you, Nick, knows I have no business entering. I'm going to ring and I'm going to knock and all that and yeah. but 
but but Amnon's being a bad guy, and I found a vulnerability in okay. his web server. Now so. here's here's a bad guy. That's a different story. That's what no, I'm no, saying. I, Amnon, Amnon, you've been mean to me. I see that there's a vulnerability in your web server. Did I hack you? Uh, who knows? I mean, if it, you if you went in, just because of the fact that there is no telling of what you did, that's that's an offense. That hey. You should have sent me an email and say, you know, your web server. Right, this right. is like Windows, you know, Windows updates. Yeah, there's a vulnerability. The Windows did not go in and break in and do anything. They just yeah. letting you know, hey. So it's, it's uh, and as things are more and more dependent <clears throat> on computers, and nobody's going to break into Amnon's server, but they will break into the power grid. They will break oh, into the Amnon train. Server is that, Amnon server is that secure? No, I'm saying it's not oh, important. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought that I mean, was a. I thought that was a. I thought you were challenging no, people on the internet. No, no, I mean I, I'm not challenging anybody to do anything. Uh, but it's <clears throat> it's very serious when when people and and Steve to go back to what you were saying, most of those people that are doing it are kids who were just trying to see if they could. But at the same point, you can say. Well, that kid was trying, or that person was trying to see if he could break into my house. So they were there at the door, and they were trying to turn the knob, and they put a credit card in there to try and open it, and they put a key in there to try to see if it works. At that point, that's an offense, in my opinion. Yeah, well, I'd agree with you there. It's... um. Is each case has to be taken on its own merit and, yeah. and needs oh, to be I, looked at very and, carefully. But I, I know for I a fact, the, uh, like I, with most other laws to do with uh, the internet these days, it, it's going to be uh, abuse something terrible. Yeah. I mean, don't forget, this is coming from the same country that if you have a password to, a, a, say, a hard drive or uh, some device, if you don't give up that password when required to do so or asked to do so by the police, you can be imprisoned. Yeah. So if you forget huh. your password and you can't access that that USB thumb drive or whatever it might be, if you've forgotten it and genuinely, then they'll send you to prison. My biggest problem here, Amnon, is what is the definition of hacking? If, is the definition yeah, is of hacking the... me uh, saying, oh, Amnon, I need to throw something on your web server here, put this file on here, and and then you put the file on there and I have access, or... If I am snooping around your server and I say, oh, oh, look at that. Hold on, hold on. My phone is ringing. Keep going. I mean, uh, uh, who knows? If, if the it's, vulnerability it's, is there, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't undermine Amnon. I didn't, I, I didn't say, hey, I uh, need a login for something. Uh, is that still hacking? I have no clue. Well, look at it the other way. If somebody sent you a file that you thought was ge genuine and, and you know f uh, was okay with no viruses on it. If you then sent that to Amnon, he put it on his server, and and there was a vulnerability that could be hacked into, not necessarily by you, but it could be deemed that or you must have sent you sent it to Amnon, so it yeah, must be you. I, you know yeah. who draws the line and says, um, you know that's that's the length of this piece of string. We need to go no further. There's way too much abuse that's, uh, that's open to uh, abuse in these, these laws that they're passing these days or secret agreements, whatever the hell you want to call them. Um, they, they need to start defining and, and being more definitive in, in specifically what the problem is and what needs to be dealt with. Yeah, because yeah, I, I really like that example. Like, Steve, you give me a file and I ask you for help something. You infect a file and I give it to Amnon, not, not w willingly, not knowing that there's a problem. And now, and now I'm in jail. Yeah, it's um, you know, they, they, you've got to look at each individual situation in yeah. detail to make up your mind who, who's actually at fault here, and that that yeah. that is exactly the same with so many other different things. Now it's like the people that are hosting websites; it's just been deemed legal in the UK. Um, uh, sorry, in, in Europe now, that you can watch video streaming from sites without uh, breaching copyright infringement which is a, a, one hell of a, a, a big step forward. So it's the person that's hosting uh, and streaming the, the stuff to you that is the one that's breaking the law, not you viewing it is, is breaking the law, which so you're is saying a massive that step forward. I, hmm. So you're saying if I was to upload 
a movie to my web server and you were to watch it that you would not be held accountable for watching no, it? I, I wouldn't be classed as infringing copyright because uh, streaming it is not made, not a permanent copy and you're not broadcasting it. Isn't so that how legally, the Pirate Bay got away with doing their stuff for, for so long? So well, they're not actually hosting any of the stuff, right? Yes and no. I mean, the the, the kangaroo court case that they had in Sweden was um, uh, was uh, completely <laughs> corrupt. And mm -hmm. the um, when you look at the, the the cases of all around Europe where the the pirate bay is being blocked, that's very questionable. And I'm sure if if they were to challenge them in court, um, it would be deemed as being uh, illegal to do so. But um, again, the, the, the laws are written so broadly that they can be um, uh, interpreted in any way that, that the authorities see fit. It's interesting. It's, um, yeah. I don't think we'll ever have a definitive answer. We probably won't, um, and I'm sure there'll be lots of protests happening around, uh, uh, certainly around in Europe, um, continuing on and on and on. And, and, uh, and probably getting nowhere, just go around and round in circles uh, and chasing our, chasing our own tails. There's a new face in the, uh, <laughs> in the Foursquare. Foursquare the app? No, Foursquare, the four squares of uh, human faces there on the screen. Hey, Mike. I guess Nick doesn't watch. What? I do watch. Hello. Hello. <laughs> I have to turn the stream on. Hey, Mike. Hello. How you doing? How long are you going to be there? Well, I'm waiting to get here to go eat, so. Yeah, okay. <laughs> we'll wait. Awesome. I, won't be I mean, I don't know what, that you want to leave now. You only have 10 minutes until the end of the show. Not a problem. <clears throat> okay. So I have now gotten... I think I've gotten Skype installed. So you figured out all the dependency discrepancies, did you? Yeah. Uh, Steve, do you have Skype open? I do, yeah. Did you see my message? Mm, not yet, no. Damn. Let's see. Just sent you one, Nick. Oh, yes, it has come up now. Okay. Yes, I see test. <clears throat> okay. Awesome. Yeah, there we go. It only took about three hours. Well, what else did you have to do today? It's had something to do with... Um, I guess I was missing some dependency. Amnon. Yeah. Why don't you introduce our guest? I am. I'm. He's doing a lower two thirds. I'm a trying to do third. a lower third. Uh oh. This is Mike Meyer. Not that Mike Meyer. The other Mike Meyer. Yeah. <laughs> this is the famous one. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, pleased to meet you, so, Mike. I'm nice to meet you Steve too. from the UK. Mike, what, what do you do on the internet? What do I do on the internet? Yeah, do you do you do anything on the internet? No, never. Never? <laughs> you don't do a, uh, a show? I or actually, anything? I do a couple shows, yeah. All right, where can people find those? Well, if it's working, it's tech-zen.tv, but when I was driving here, my server appears to be offline, so I don't know what's going on. Oh, let's see. That... I, need, I need to hire somebody from some kind of web designer, maybe, maybe uh 16, 17 year old web designer. Oh, that's fine. Just pay me and then charge me back. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, just pay him by PayPal and put it in contest. Yeah. Uh oh. Tech Zen, Tech Dash Zen, right? Yep, Tech Dash Zen TV. Ah, Skype just crashed. Damn. So if your Skype's crashed, how are you in the oh, Skype? I'm testing Skype on Ubuntu. Oh, okay. 
appears to have completely. But yes, frozen. I could see that texting that you sent, Nick. All right. <clears throat> now we got to figure out how to force quit. I didn't an know what you were text testing, but now I know. Oh. All right. Let's see how to force quit Skype. Movie buff says, "Mike, new setup." Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Amazon's probably going to be releasing a smartphone the 18th. They're having an event in Seattle on June 18th, where they're most likely going to release their brand new smartphone. It'll probably be similar, a similar UI to the Kindle. Uh, Rumored specs are 4.7 inch 720p display, quad core, uh, Qualcomm Snapdragon processor, and two gigs of RAM. And the big thing with this phone is that it uh, most likely, or from rumors, it'll have six cameras so that it will be able to do uh, 3D tracking of yourself and provide you with a 3D display. But those are just all rumors. Is it? I'm assuming it's still running the same Android operating system underneath. <clears throat> It will, but the, my, my biggest thing with um, with the Amazon stuff is it doesn't have the Play Store. So all of the apps that I've purchased and, and, and paid for, I'm either going to have to re I'm I'm going to have to rebuy them if they're on the Amazon Store. So th that that's my biggest problem with with the Amazon smartphone is that it's just it doesn't have the Google Play Store, and I have to rebuy all my stuff. Do you know what carriers it's on? Does it say? It doesn't say yet. Um, it doesn't mention anything about having a SIM card slot. So actually, it does appear that it has one in this picture that I'm looking at. So I would assume it will work on any carrier that's got a SIM card. But that leaves out Verizon and Sprint. Yeah. But Verizon, T-Mobile, or Sprint and T-Mobile might be merging. So who knows what will happen. It will be interesting. So Actually, it's open to anybody to go. So if you're going to be in Seattle on the 18th, you can just sign up to go. I guess they're really looking for people to go. It's on their front page. If you go to Amazon.com or you go to that website, you can fill out the form and they'll just let you go. For, I guess they just need people uh, there. They're where? The, the Amazon event in Seattle. <clears throat> um, boy, this is... What are you trying to do, Amnon? That's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> trying to put me in the data center. Amnon, we have like three minutes left. <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, this is, this is nice practice, though. I always screw up when I go into I go into the overlay versus the effect. All right. Well, but I didn't even have to adjust the the chroma key. It's fine. So what do you think of Amnon's setup, hmm. Mike? It's a lot different than what I've seen. It looks a lot different than what I was seeing before, you know. I don't want to see where his you, desk is. I always seems sitting at his desk, so What did you think it was going to look like? Well, every studio is different. It just I never thought it was square like this. So, how do you like his desk with the rounded corners? He's trying to emulate an iPhone. Uh, yeah. Okay. I see that. <laughs> Did you make so a desk for him? Nah, he's he's an Apple fan boy. Oh. Who's an Apple hey, fan? You, you are. Yeah. <laughs> how many right. Apple computers do you have? All right. Mike. I guess we can end this. Yep. I'm not ready. Oh, okay. Right. No, I'm Just sorry. Go Nick, ahead. Give Go him ahead, the login. Nick. Yeah. Nick? Yes. Go ahead. Uh, it, was, it was a joke. Oh. Um. Mark, you're visiting. You, you're coming in, down from yep. Maryland? From Maryland. Yep. yep. We're heading back oh. to Maryland. No. How long? Of a trip do you have ahead of you? Uh, what, five and a half hours, six hours? Oof. Damn. I don't see your car on the driveway. I parked behind one of the cars that's out there. 
Huh. Unless somebody took it already. It could be. <laughs> we don't Mike, have that much of a problem here. Mike Phillips took it. No, I'm too far what away. What are you driving? Uh, Murano. He's on Murano. All right. All I right. really did drive here. <laughs> huh? You walked all the way from Maryland? <laughs> It was a, a six-month trek. Yeah. Oh, it may be stuck. It is. Ah, uh, your camera security says security camera. The security the camera was stuck, and then I'm, I'm still seeing the <clears throat> same. Now I see the car. Okay. Never <laughs> mind. That's why I didn't see you. Ah. Uh. All right. So um, this was fun. Yeah, it was a good show. Yes, it was. Yep. Um, any any last words? Yes. If you're still using Microsoft Security Essentials as part of your XP installation, you need to uninstall it and install Avast or some other program today. I have another. I have a closing. Okay. If you're still using Windows XP, yeah, yeah, actually, here we go. <laughs> make sure you upgrade. Get a Mac. Make sure you use Vista. It's much better. Yeah. All right. Actually, Vista is not better than XP, but that's another story. Well, thank you for clearing that up for me. Anytime. Yeah, if you're still All right, I'm getting off XP. here because I got to head over there. Bye bye for now. All right. Have a great week, everybody. Yep. This was uh, this was a lot of fun. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Good morning, Kathy, Hannah, Nabil, Mac. No. Katie and Donna, thank you for tuning to Computers 2K Now. We hope you enjoyed and maybe learned something from our time together. Remember to practice safe computing. Back up your hard drive and update your virus scanner. We'll be back here next Sunday at 9, but you can always reach us at computers2know.com. While you're at it, like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Tomorrow morning, there is no health in, but there is uh, breaking free at 1. And Tanya Love Show at 7. See you then, everybody. Happy birthday. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. Our weekly lineup of call-in programs includes Computers 2K Now with Amnon Nissan, Health In with Debbie Brook, Breaking Free with Marilyn Shannon, Lessons of Vietnam with NCVVI members, The Tanya Love Show, Reawaken Your Brilliance with Julie Seibert, and if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it at www.nissancommunications.com. Sponsored by Atomus.com makers of quality video recorders and converters for professionals. That vidblasterguy.com, carolinaapparel.com, and deltaforce.net.